Lucky Strike program, starring Jack Benny, with Barry Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wolf. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight Jack Benny is flying to New York City. So let's go out to Jack's home in Beverly Hills where we find him packing for the trip. Mary and Rochester are helping him. Now let's see. One, two, three. Uh, what else do you want me to do, Jack? Nothing now, Mary. One, two, three. Four, oh, shall I pack just, you? Just a minute, Rochester. Four, five, six, seven. Seven. That ought to be enough. Now, why don't you take the whole box? How much does Kleenex cost? <laughs> Mary, it isn't the cost of the Kleenex. I'm going by plane, and they charge you extra, you know, if your luggage weighs over 40 pounds. <laughs> See, it's 79 cents a pound in New York. Unless you get off at Chicago, then it's 57 cents. Or Kansas City, it's 46 cents. <laughs> Uh, why don't you go to New York and send your clothes to Albuquerque? Same. Oh, stop, will you? <laughs> but, Jack, you're going to be gone a whole week. Uh, aren't you taking any suits? Certainly. I'm taking my blue serge, my tweed, my herringbone, and, uh... Your pinstripe and your gabardine. Yes, yes. Uh, that's five suits. I don't see any of them in the bag. He's wearing them. They don't weigh the passengers. <laughs> I know what I'm doing. Uh, Jack... Uh, what are you going to New York for, anyway? Oh, I thought I told you, Mary. I'm going to appear at a benefit for the American Heart Association Wednesday night at the Copacabana. Ed Sullivan asked me to be the master of ceremonies. Gee, it'll seem strange. Now, I haven't worked in a nightclub since that summer I was at Ciro. That was a sensation there. Oh, you certainly were, Jack. How'd you learn to carry 14 cups of coffee on one arm? <laughs> Mary, I was just showing that trick to a couple of friends of mine. I wasn't working there as a waiter. Then why'd you pick up the tips? Pick up the tip. Pick up the tip. <laughs> Eighty cents. You make a big thing out. <laughs> now let's see. What else do I need? I better take a couple of sweaters and my. Hey, boss. What? Do you want to take your sleeping bag along? No, no. I'll go to a hotel this time. <laughs> oh, then you won't need your bow and arrow. No, no. I don't blame you, Jack. There's nothing worse for breakfast than a tough squirrel cooked over the exhaust pipe of a cross-town bus. Yeah, yeah. By the way, Rochester, did you order my tuxedo like I told you to? Yes, sir. Here it is. All of your tuxedo? Yeah, I told Rochester to take the satin cuffs off the sleeve. You know, satin cuffs are a little dated. No. <laughs> that belt in the back isn't exactly cafe society. <laughs> it'll do, it'll do. Here, Mary, you better pack the tuxedo. Fold it carefully so I won't have to have it pressed. Okay. Say, Jack, it's a funny place to have a pocket in the back lining of a coat. Oh, that. Well, Mary, I used to do a magic act when I was in Vaudeville, and that's where I kept my rabbit. That was a pigeon, boss. No, it was a rabbit. Oh, it was a pigeon. Rocket, sir, this was 15 years ago, and you wouldn't remember. It was a rabbit. Boss, it was a pigeon, as a matter of fact. When I went through your clothes this morning, I found an egg in that pocket. <laughs> well, that was a mothball. I wish you'd have told me sooner you had it for breakfast. <laughs> Oh, well, it smelled like a mothball. But you're right, Rochester. You're right. You know, it was a pigeon I used in my vaudeville act. Her name was Natalie. See, I'll never forget. She used to sit up on my head and coo while I played my violin. That pigeon was so cute sitting on my head. I remember the night they knocked it off with a tomato. Yeah. I wonder what they had against Natalie. <laughs> Whatever became of that pigeon, boss? Rochester, I'd rather not talk about it. Well, Jack, I want to know, too. What became of that pigeon? Well, things got tough for me in Vaudeville, and I got hungry, and... Oh, let's not talk about it. Now, Mary... Don't worry, Polly. I'm doing all right now. <laughs> Come on, Mary. Let's get this packing finished so that I can... I'll get it. Hello, Mr. Benny. Oh, hello, Dennis. Come on in. Hello, Dennis. Hello, Mary. Say, hey, what's all the packing going on? Well, Jack's going to New York. Oh, well, Mr. Benny, as long as you're going to New York, why don't you stay at the Acme Plaza Hotel? My uncle's the house detective there. Your uncle, the house detective? What's his name? Peekaboo McNulty. <laughs> Peekaboo McNulty? 
He must be some detective. Yeah. Oh, he's wonderful. During the war, he was a spy, but the enemy caught him, put him up against the wall, and executed him. Wait a minute, kid. You just said he's working at the Acme Plaza Hotel. After the war, they had to give him a job back. <laughs> Look, Dennis, I got a lot of packing to do, so don't bother me now, will you? Okay. Do you mind if I go into the other room and practice my song a bit? No, no. Go right ahead. Go in the living room. There's a player piano in there. Now, come on, Mary, and help me finish. Jack, it's getting late. You better hurry. Oh, yes, yes. Dennis, Dennis, you want to drive down to the airport with us? I'd like to, but I got my bicycle with me. I'll meet you there. Okay. Come on, Rochester, get the car. Now, Rochester, turn left on Sepulveda, and it'll take you right to the airport. Yes, sir. Rochester, what are you doing? I'm trying to pass that Cadillac. I must be crazy. <laughs> Don't be funny. Just drive. Say, Jack, while you're in New York, you think you'll run into Fred Allen? You mean buttons and bags? <laughs> no, no, I don't think I'll see Fred. It won't be necessary this time. I sent him my old clothes by parcel post. <laughs> he wanted them in time for the Easter parade. <laughs> Anyway, I might run into him when I... Hey, look, Jack. There's Dennis on his bicycle. Oh, yeah. Hello, Dennis. Hi, Mr. Benny. Pass him, Rochester. <laughs> Aren't the legs tired from all that peddling, kid? No, this is fun. That's good. Pass him, Rochester. <laughs> you want to hit on the back, Dennis? Come on, we'll give you a lift. No, thanks. This is good exercise. Yes, yeah, good exercise, all right. Pass him, Rochester. <laughs> Pass him. Embarrassing, ain't it? <laughs> well, step on it or something. So long, Mr. Benny. I'll wait for you at the airport. You come back here. <laughs> all right, all right. Go on. That reckless kid. <laughs> I'll try to go a little faster, Rochester. I don't want to miss my plane. You know, it's a very important benefit. <laughs> Here's the airport, Rochester. Pull over at the curb. Come on, Mary. I'd better get a red cap to take my bag. I wonder where the... Oh, there's one. Oh, red cap, will you... Hmm. He looked at me and walked away. There's another one. Oh, red cap, will you take my... <laughs> He walked away, too. Here comes another one, Jack. Oh, yes. I'll take your bag for you, Mr. Benny. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You know, I can't understand it. When I call those other red caps, they walked away, but you came right over. Well, I figured if you can do a benefit, so can I. <laughs> well, you, you don't have to do this for nothing. Take my bag, and here's a tip for you. Gee, thanks. Now I can get my head shined. Come on, Mary. Let's go inside. Flight number 76 for Phoenix, Dallas, and Washington, D.C. Now loading at gate two. Mary, let's go over to the information desk. I want to find out if my plane is going to leave on time. Flight 43 now arriving on runway six from Galveston, Houston, Fort Worth, and Empty Jug. <laughs> I thought Phil was kidding. Say, Mary, before I go over the information desk, I want to get some magazines. Okay, while well, you're doing that, I'll get your ticket validated. Oh, thanks, thanks. Hiya, you, bud? Long time no see. <laughs> huh? <laughs> oh, 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 hello. Uh... <laughs> uh, who was that, Jack? Oh, that's that racetrack cow from Santa Anita. It always bothers me. I'll, I'll meet you back here, Mary. Okay. I give my regards to Broadway. Remember me. I'll take these two magazines and maybe I'll get a book. Attention, please. Attention. Flight number 19 now loading at gate 5 for Anaheim, Azusa, 
And far away places with strange sounding names and coke kamanga. Gee, I might I might get hungry on the plane. Maybe I ought to buy some fruit or something. Say, the, these apples look good. Yeah, I'll get some of these apples. Oh, Miss! Miss! Oh, darn it, she's busy. Well, I'll just have to wait. Hey, Bud. Huh? Come here a minute. Look. Look, fella, I... What are you doing? I'm buying some fruit. What kind? I'm buying apples. Uh Uh-uh. What? Take the oranges. But I I don't want oranges. How about grapes? Haven't got a chance. They're carrying too many seeds. Oh, well, well, what about the bananas? I've been watching them for three days. I have yet to see one of them get out of the bunch. (laughs) Well, look, I, I don't know. Listen to me, bud. Take the oranges. The oranges? They can't miss. Look at the breeding. Out of Pomona by Smudge Pie. <laughs> well, I I wanted apples, but <laughs> or maybe <laughs> I wanted apples, but maybe you're right. I'll take the oranges. Okay, okay, and peel them. <laughs> Don't be a sucker. Miss, I'll take three of those oranges, please, and peel them. Attention, please, attention. The Santa Fe Super Chief now landing on runway seven. How could that happen? It was awfully windy in Barstow. Let's see, where was I going? Oh, yes, to the information desk. Uh, Pardon me, are you the information clerk? No. No, they put me behind these bars for toasting marshmallows on the street. <laughs> Look, mister, I'm in a hurry. Now, when do I leave for New York? I don't know, but it can't be too soon for me. <laughs> now, wait a minute. You're here to give me information. Well, if you tell me what flight you're on, I'll tell you when you leave. Oh, I'm taking flight... 58. A flight 58 leaves at 745, makes one stop at Kansas City, flies at an altitude of 17,000 feet at a speed of 300 miles per hour. Oh. They serve dinner and breakfast. The pilots' names are Frank and Harry. They arrive in New York at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Bone voyage, and I hope you get sick. <laughs> Why, I'd punch you right in the nose if I didn't have to take off five coats. I'll be more civil or I'll report you to the management. What gate does my plane leave from? In number nine. That's better. How long will the flight take? Ten hours. Well, that's good. Are the seats comfortable? Ooh, are they? <laughs> oh, what do you? Now, let's see. Where did Mary go? Oh, there she is. Attention, please. Flight 21 now leading for San Joaquin Valley, Sun Valley, Imperial Valley, and Apple Valley. Hey, Bud, Bud, huh? Come here a minute. <laughs> Attention, please. Flight 21 now leaving for San Joaquin Valley, Sun Valley, Imperial Valley, and Orange, New Jersey. (laughs) Oh, Mary! Mary! Here I am, Jack, and here are your tickets. Oh, thanks. Flight number 58 for New York leaving immediately. Oh, my goodness, that's my plane. I've got to run. Goodbye, Mary. Goodbye. I'll call you from New York. Goodbye, Jack. I'll wait here and watch the plane take off. Okay, and I'll wave to you from the window. Oh, oh, boy. Watch your step getting into the plane, please. How you trying to watch the plane off? Gee, there it goes into the air. What a beautiful takeoff. Yep, they'll be in New York in ten hours. Look, the planes are turning around and coming back. Coming in for a landing. Well, I'll be darned. Jack! Jack, what happened? I forgot.
drop my oranges. <laughs> okay, pilot, I got them. Let's go. Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, tonight Jack has a date to take Mary to a movie, so let's go out to his house in Beverly Hills where Rochester is helping him get ready. Uh, Rochester, get out my razor and give me a shave, please. Oh, boss, do I have to shave you, too? Last night I gave you a haircut. You did? Yeah, didn't you notice it when I, when you put it on this morning? <laughs> well, that's the silliest thing I ever heard of. The hair on a toupee doesn't grow. The one you bought doesn't. I'm talking about the one you trapped yourself. <laughs> Which one was that? The one with the white stripe. <laughs> I had to comb it with an air wig. Now, Rochester, stop being silly and give me a shave. Okay, hold still while I lather you up. Rochester, do you have to use that much? Hold still, boss. There, that ought to be enough lather. Now, where's the razor? Come in! Hiya, Roch. I was passing by and I... Say, that looks wonderful. <laughs> Bill, stop trying to blow the foam off. It's me. <laughs> and get your foot off my knee. It's not a brass rail. What a guy. All right, I'm sorry, Jackson. What do you want, Phil? Well, I just dropped by to ask you if you can come over to the house tomorrow night. You see, I'm throwing a little party. Oh, sure, Phil. I'll be glad to come. Shall I have dinner first? No, of course not. I got everything all set. I've been preparing for the party all week. Yeah, what are you having? Well, there'll be Manhattans, Old Fashions, <laughs> bourbon highballs, martinis, scotch and soda. Phil, bourbon... Phil, wait a minute. I mean food. Food. What? <laughs> I said, what are you, you going to have to eat? Well, if you don't like olives, don't come. <laughs> Look, a uh, pimento boy. <laughs> How in the world... Ouch! Rochester, you cut me. It's about time you felt it. I did it a minute ago. <laughs> well, why didn't you tell me? I thought you were dead. <laughs> Don't be funny. Did you cut me bad? That's ah, nothing, boss. I just snipped the stem off your Adam's apple. <laughs> you clumsy thing. I have to buy a collar button. <laughs> Phil. <laughs> Phil, about the party... I'll be at your house at 8 o'clock. What's the occasion? It's Alice's birthday. Oh, good, good. I'll bring her some candy. Look, Jackson, you gave her candy last year and she never got to eat any of it. She didn't? No, she was carrying it upstairs and the bag broke. <laughs> Gee, that's a shame. And those jawbreakers roll so, too. <laughs> I'll get the square ones this time. Uh-oh! What's the matter, Rochester? Did I cut you again? Well, can't you tell? It would help if you'd bleed a little. <laughs> well, I'm not going to force myself just for you. <laughs> Say, Phil, what are you giving Alice for her birthday? Well, I got it right here in this little box. Let me show it to you. There. Isn't that pretty? Oh, Phil, what a beautiful gold locket. she loved that. Well, open it up, Jackson. Uh, there's a picture inside... No, Phil, I'd rather not. Alice should be the first one to see it. Oh, we don't mind, Jackson. Gee, you're like one of the family. Go ahead. Open the locket. Well, all right. Oh, now, isn't that sweet? A picture of Patrillo. <laughs> How thoughtful. Yeah, that's very nice. Phil, you can raise your head. I close the lock. <laughs> Here. Well, look, Phil, I wish I had more time to talk to you, but I'm taking Mary to the movies pretty soon. I've got to get dressed. <laughs> Just 
Just one more bobby pin, Miss Livingston, and I'll have your hair finished. There. Here's the mirror. Oh, Pauline, I've never had my hair fixed so nice before. Oh, it is nice, isn't it? It's a brand new hairdo. I saw it on television the other night. On a style show? No, I'm Gorgeous George. <laughs> well, it's time I got something back. You learned the half Nelson from my sister, Babe. <laughs> Now, hurry, Pauline. I don't want to be late. Mr. Benny is taking me to the movies. We're going to the Cameo Theater. The Cameo? Yes, Pauline. Uh, have you been there? Not since they raised the price to 15 cents. <laughs> 15 cents? Oh, they had to do that when they sandpapered the benches. <laughs> benches. He would. I'm going to call up Mr. Benny and tell him... That... Oh, I I'll get it, Miss Livingston. Hello, Pauline. Oh, hello, Miss Stanwyck. Is Miss Livingston in? Yes, Miss Stanwyck. Here she comes now. Hello, Mary. Oh, hello, Barbara. Gee, I'm glad to see you. How's Bob? He's fine. Say, Mary, am I intruding? You look like you're going out. If you want to call it that. Jack's taking me to movie, and I just found out it's a 15-cent one. I'll bet it's the Cameo Theater. It is the Cameo. Has Bob ever taken you there? Not since they sandpapered the benches. <laughs> Oh, for heaven's sake, I didn't know Bob was cheap, too. Well, he wasn't always Mary, but he started running around with Jack and got some of it on him. <laughs> well, it is contagious. Anyway, Barbara, what are you doing tonight? Nothing. Good. Then you come to the movies, too, and we'll make Jack buy three tickets. We'll what? Uh, we'll make Jack buy three tickets. Okay. While you're choking him, I'll use my brass knuckles. <laughs> well, anyway, let's try. Come on, let's go over to Jack's house. Okay. Oh, by the way, Barbara, that's a beautiful hairdo you have. Gorgeous, George? No, nature boy. <laughs> well, it's very becoming. Come on, let's go. Well, I'm through shaving you, boss. Gosh, Rochester, what a rough shave you gave me. You nicked me so many times. Did you cut me very deep? I ain't saying, but if I held your nose and mouth, you could still breathe. <laughs> well, it's the last time you're going to shave me. It almost was. I know, I know. Oh, that must be Mary now. Come in. Oh. Hello, Dennis. Hello, Mr. Benny. Did you hear the one about the two Irishmen who got on a street Come car? Come on in, Dennis. <laughs> Thank you. Did you hear the one about the two Irishmen who got on a streetcar? Close street the door, kid. Okay. <coughs> Did you hear the one about the two Irishmen who got on a... Sit down. Sit down, Dennis. Thanks. Did you hear the one about the two Irishmen who got on a streetcar? No. No, I didn't. I wish you had. I forgot the answer. <laughs> no, Dennis... What did you come over for? Well, do I have to have a reason to come over and see you? No, Who I just... Who do you think you are, Winston Churchill? <laughs> oh, Dennis, I merely asked you why you came over here. Well, watch it next time. <laughs> Look, kid, I'm not going to stand here and... Come in. Well, here I am, Jack. Good. Now we can go to... Well, Barbara Stanwyck. Hello, Jack. Mary invited me to come Barbara, along so we could... Uh, Barbara, wait for your applause. She got it at my house. Oh. Oh, <laughs> oh good. <laughs> well, that's good. Good. <laughs> they had a lot of people over at your house. Yeah? Uh, come on in. Well, hello, Dennis. Hello, Mary. Oh, Barbara, I want you to meet Dennis Day. Dennis, this is Barbara Stanwyck. Barbara Stanwyck? Gee. Hello, little man. Little man? <laughs> little man, if you know what kind of a guy I am, you'd run for your life. <laughs> Dennis, stop with that silly talk. Well, I want Miss Stanwyck to have respect for me. Oh. I do respect you, and I think you're very sweet. You do? Of course I do. Would you ask me for a date if you were sure I'd accept? Well, I wouldn't say that. You see, the man I like to go out with is, well, my husband, Robert Taylor. But he's married. <laughs> I certainly hope so. 
Well, come on, Jack. Let's get started. It's time we went to the movies. You know, Mary, as long as Barbara dropped in, it isn't polite for you and me to go to the movies. I've only got two passes, you know. That's <laughs> all he gave me for sandpapering the benches. <laughs> But say, kids, I've got an idea. Why don't we stay home and play gin rummy? I don't want to play gin rummy. But girls, you wouldn't enjoy yourselves. It's a Western picture. Oh, I love a good Western. But it's not a good Western, Barbara. It's even been refused by television. (laughs) Believe me, it's no good. Well, if you don't want to go, we'll go by ourselves. Come on, Barbara. Okay, so long, kids. Oh, by the way, girls, would you like my passes? No, we can make a better deal at the box office. (laughs) Okay. Now, Dennis. Just a minute. Oh, Miss Stanwyck. Yes. Dennis! (laughs) Now, come back here. Now, I wish... I wish you wouldn't act so silly. What did I do that was silly? Trying to date a Barbara Stanwyck at your age. It would be sillier at your age. <laughs> what did you say? Miss Stanwyck would have fallen in love with me if it hadn't been for you. Me? What did I have to do with it? Well, she thinks you're Winston Churchill. Oh, quiet. <laughs> anyway, dear, what makes you think Miss Stanwyck would fall in love with a kid like you? I could tell by the way she looked at me. Huh? If you and Miss Livingston hadn't been here, she couldn't have controlled herself. Dennis. Dennis, what's happened to you? I don't know, but it feels good. (laughs) Now, look, Dennis. I've had just about enough out of you. You come over to my house, eat my fruit, and I've been watching you. (laughs) Now, you go on home, and when you feel like apologizing for the way you acted, you can come back. Okay, and goodbye. 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 And get your hand out of the fruit bowl. (laughs) Now go home and think it over. I'll show Mr. Benny, such a wise guy. Pays me $35 a week and expects me to sing good. I'll get even with him. Next Sunday I'll sing lousy. That's what I'll do. You're darn right. I'll sing like this. (laughs) Say, that wasn't so bad. But I'll sing lousy on the program if I have to practice to do it. I'll show Mr. Benny. Oh, darn it, I passed my house. I always do that. I always do that, too. Oh, well. Oh, Mother! Mother! Your mother isn't home, son. Who are you? Your father. (laughs) Oh, hello, Pop. I was just over to Mr. Benny's house. Well, take a bath and no one will notice it. (laughs) Okay. Say, Pop, I just had a big fight with Mr. Benny about Barbara Stanwyck. Who? Barbara Stanwyck. Gee, Papa, she beautiful. She's got eyes like stars, lips like rubies, a figure like Venus to Milo, and... A... Gee, Papa, am I making you nervous? No, why? You're tearing up Mother's picture. <laughs> I'll get the glue. You mind your own business. <laughs> Even you're against me. Everybody's against me. I'm going to get undressed and go to bed. get along without Jack Benny, believe me. And another thing, from now on, I'm going to listen to Fred Allen with the door wide open. (laughs) No more of that sneaky stuff. I'll show Mr. Benny. Oh, boy, this bed feels good. I don't need Jack Benny. Take your hands out of the fruit bowl. Take your hands out of the fruit bowl. I only ate three apples. What's he yelling about anyway? They're made of wax. (laughs) (sighs) Mr. Benny doesn't know it, but a lot of people have told me I ought to be the star of the program. 
girls will be crazy about me. Gee, imagine. Star of the Lucky Strike program. Dennis Day, a big star. All the girls will be crazy about me. Big star. Girls. Big star. Girls. Strike program starring Dennis Day with Winston Churchill, Ali Khan, two Irishmen on a streetcar, our singing star, Margaret Truman, and yours truly, Moby Dick. <laughs> and now we bring you the star of our show, Dennis Day. Hello again. This is Dennis Day coming to you from Galway Bay, and we will open the show with a song by Frankie Harris and Dinah Livingston. And now, folks, for our feature attraction tonight... Answer the phone, Don. Yes, sir. Hello? Hello. I'd like to speak to Dennis Day, please. This is Miss Stanwick. Miss Stanwick? Gee, just a minute, please. It's for you, Dennis. It's Barbara Stanwick. Oh, is that dame calling again? <laughs> drives me nuts. Tell her I'm not in. But, Dennis... You heard me, fat boy. (laughs) Tell her I'm not in. Okay. Uh, Miss Stanwyck, I'm sorry, but Mr. Day isn't in. I know he's there. I know it. I heard his voice. Tell him I've got to speak to him. Please, please. Yes, ma'am. Dennis, she insists on talking to you. Oh, all right. I'll give her a thrill. (laughs) Hello? Dennis. Dennis, I must talk to you. It's urgent. Oh, hello, urgent. (laughs) No, no, it's Barbara. Oh, well, what do you want, kid? Dennis. Dennis, I haven't heard from you in five days. What's the matter? What's happened between us? You've been neglecting me. You've changed, Dennis. You're not the same. I know it. I can feel it. If there's anything I should know, I wish you'd tell me. Well, if you must know, I don't love you anymore, toots. (laughs) How can you do this to me, Dennis, after you made me give up nature, boy? I must see you alone, someplace where we can talk. Meet me at the Brown Derby. The Brown Derby? Okay, goodbye. Goodbye, darling. Until I see you again, the minutes will drag like hours. The hours will drag like days. The days will drag like... Ah, shut up. (laughs) Thank you. Hmm. Oh, well, I might as well meet her and get this over with. It's crowded here at the Brown Derby. A table for Mr. Day. A table for Mr. Day. A day for Mr. Table. A day for Mr. Table. A derby for Mr. Brown. A derby for Mr. Brown. A derby for Mr. Day. It's Derby Day! (laughs) But, darling, darling, it's been five days. Five whole days since I've seen you. It was never like this before, never. Not so loud. People are listening. Let's order something to eat. Oh, waiter. Waiter. Yes, Mr. Day. (laughs) Uh, What will you have, sir? Two fried Irishmen on a whole wheat streetcar. (laughs) Yes, sir. And what will you have, madame? The same thing and hold the transfer. Yes, madame, but first, would you mind standing up for a minute? Why? I want to sandpaper the benches. (laughs) Thank you. Oh, Dennis, it's been such a wonderful evening. Just being near you again has given me something to live for. Well, I'm sorry, Sugarfoot, but this is the end. I'm never going to see you again. No. No, Dennis, darling, don't say that. You mustn't say that. I love you. I love you. You mustn't leave me. You mustn't. (laughs) Tell me more. You fascinate me. (laughs) You're cruel. You're heartless. You're selfish. You're urgent. (laughs) Dennis, you're making fun of me. You're tormenting me. If you leave me now, I'll kill myself. Do you hear me? I'll kill myself. You wouldn't dare. (laughs) Oh, yes, I would. 
Do you see this gun? Yeah. Will you tell me that you love me or I'll shoot myself right now? Well. Say you love me or I'll shoot myself. Well, I love you. Oh, my goodness, she did it. She did it. Oh, waiter, waiter, waiter. Yes? Separate checks, please. Separate checks? Yes, she killed herself, but it wasn't my fault. I'm not to blame. Oh, yes, you are, Dennis Day. Wait a minute. You're not the waiter. You're Jack Benny. Yes. <laughs> and I saw you kill her. No, no, I didn't, Mr. Benny. Really, I didn't. She killed herself. Yes, and you're just letting her lie there. Yes, Dennis Day, you drove her to suicide, and you'll sit and fry in the electric chair. <laughs> No, I won't. No, I won't. Barbara, Barbara, speak to me. <laughs> You've killed her. She's dead. Barbara, speak to me. Get up. Get up. What for? They gave it to Jane Wyman. <laughs> you see, Dennis, you killed her. You killed her! You killed her! Get away from me! Get away from me! Mother! Mother! Father! 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 What's the matter, son? What's the matter? What are you screaming about? Oh, Father, I just had the most horrible nightmare. Oh, was that all? For a minute, I thought your mother came home. <laughs> now go back to sleep. Okay. Good night, Pop. Good night. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank Ruby Stevens, better known as Barbara Stanwyck, for appearing here tonight. For appearing here tonight through the courtesy of Robert Taylor, better known as Spangler Arlington Bruce. And be sure to listen to Eugene Patrick McNulty in A Day in the Life of Dennis Day. Good night, folks. The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, the Sportsman Quartet, and yours truly, Don Wilson. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, it's Easter Sunday, and in cities all over the country, people are Easter parading. Right now in Beverly Hills, Jack is getting ready for his stroll down Wilshire Boulevard. At the moment, he's uh, taking a shower, and Rochester is laying out his clothes. Mm, Mr. Benny's been in that shower for a long time. It's funny the way the boss always puts on a bathing cap to keep his hair dry. <laughs> Once it didn't work, he put on the bathing cap and then put his hair on top of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he looked like a cantaloupe with sideburns. <laughs> Well, I, I better get his clothes out. Say, here's a suit he wore home from New York, and I haven't sent it to the cleaners yet. I'll take it and... Uh-oh. What's this book that fell out of his pocket? Well, it's Mr. Benny's diary. I wonder if I should read it. No, I better not. He sure got mad the last time I read it. Anyway, if Mr. Benny wanted me to know what he did in New York, he'd tell me. But he's been home over a week, and he ain't told me, so here goes. <laughs> Ah, uh, here's the first entry. April 4th. Dear Diary, the flight to New York was exciting. Traveling by airplane is very pleasant, except they give the passengers free food, magazines, and chewing gum. I couldn't sell a darn thing. <laughs> <laughs> mm, I wonder what he did with that gallon of coffee and four dozen sandwiches uh, he took with him. I arrived in New York this morning, cheerful but bloated. <laughs> I guess he didn't eat all his sandwiches. The next entry is written peanut butter. <laughs> April 5th, dear diary. This morning I was walking down Broadway and ran into Fred Allen. And I must say that Fred looks wonderful. 
He had all the wrinkles taken out of his face, and luckily they didn't have to use surgery. Fred's face has so so much loose skin, they just pulled his ears back and tied them in a bow. <laughs> like an Easter bunny. <laughs> mm, Mr. Benny's diary sure is dumb. Two days in New York and he ain't been to Harlem yet. April 6th. Dear diary, last night I attended a dinner party at the home of Mr. William Paley. He's the head of CBS. I sat on the right of his lovely wife, Barbara. Mrs. Paley is certainly a charming woman. I wonder what network he got her from. <laughs> April 7th. Talk to my sponsor today. Well, now it's getting interesting. April 8th. Talk to my sponsor today. April 9th. Talk to my sponsor today. April 10th. Talk to my sponsor today. April 11th. Talk to my lawyer today. <laughs> April 12th, my lawyer talked to my sponsor today. <laughs> April 13th, my lawyer will be my summer replacement. <laughs> April 14th, starter for home on the Santa Fe Super Chief. The Super Chief is a wonderful train, but I think I enjoyed the plane trip more. The hostess had prettier legs than the conductor. <laughs> well, I'll be darned. No mention of Harlem at all. If he didn't go to Harlem, why'd he bother... Oh, him? Rochester. Rochester. Uh-oh, here he comes. I better hide the diary. Rochester, what are you doing? I was looking through this suit to see if it needed to be sent to the cleaners. Oh, well, while I finish dressing, look through the closet, see if there's anything else that needs cleaning. Yes, sir. Uh, what about this gray suit, boss? I don't know. How does it look to you? Well, it's got a gravy stain on the sleeve, salad dressing on the pants, butter on the cup, coffee on the lapel, and meat sauce all over the vest. It has? Yeah. Shall I send it to the cleaner or put it in the refrigerator? <laughs> uh, send it to the cleaner. But first, uh, Rochester, go through the pockets and make sure I didn't leave any money in it. Oh, boss, come on now. <laughs> Never mind, just do it. Well, I'm all dressed, Rochester. How do I look? Fine, but you better put your glasses on. Oh, I'm not going to wear my glasses. They, they make me look old. But you don't see too well without them. Rochester, I only need my glasses for reading. Now, let's see. I think I'll take a cop, uh, top coat with me in case I... I'll get it. Oh, hello, Phil. I'm Mary. <laughs> oh, 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 happy Easter, Mary. Well, I'm ready to go walking if you are. I'm ready, Jack. But aren't you going to say anything about my new dress? Let's see. Say, it's very pretty. But, Mary, isn't it kind of daring? Well, no, this is the latest style. It's called a plunging neckline. Well, you better grab it fast, sister. It's getting away from you. <laughs> Don't be silly, Jack. Plunging necklines are the latest style. All the girls will be wearing them today. They will? Yes. Oh, Rochester, bring me my glasses. <laughs> Thanks. Well, come on, Mary, let's go to the boulevard and stroll in the Easter parade. <laughs> Gee, there are a lot of people on Wilshire Boulevard, aren't there, Mary? Yeah, and everybody's dressed so nice. Well, so are you. See, that new hat you're wearing is really cute. Where'd you get it? The May Company. They give me all my clothes. The May Company gives you all your clothes? See, that's funny. You've been working for me for the past 15 years. I know. They send me food, too. <laughs> oh, well, that's nice of them. Hey, Jack. What? How far do you think we ought to walk? Oh, I don't know. Probably as far as La Brea. <laughs> you know, Larry, but strolling along the boulevard today reminds me of that picture we saw with Fred Astaire and Judy Garland. You mean Easter Parade? Yeah, that's the one. Remember at the start of the picture when Fred Astaire was walking along Fifth Avenue singing that song and the people all answered him? How did that song go again? <laughs> Gee, I'll never forget how... Hey, Mary. Hey, Mary, look. Look. Huh? 
Look, stepping up on the curb. Get a load of those legs. Oh, who is it? The conductor on the super cheap. <laughs> Now, come on, Mary. we got to keep up with the crowd, you know. I want to walk all the way down to La Brea. Say, Jack, look. There's Phil Harris standing on the corner. Oh, yes. Hello, Phil. Hiya, Livy, you little Easter bunny. Who's that egg you got with you? <laughs> Don, I forgot to take off my bathing cap. <laughs> <laughs> Say, Phil, Mary and I are strolling down Wilshire. Want to join us? No, no, Jack. The Chamber of Commerce wants me to stand here till another bus comes by. Another bus? Yeah, I'm the grand finale of the 95-cent tour. <laughs> What? Them out-of-towners go nuts. <laughs> oh, brother. Uh, Phil, uh, Phil, aren't you a little conceited? Nah, conceited is when you think you got it and you ain't. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, Phil... You've got it. Sixteen silver dollars in a box of Snickers to that gray-haired gentleman with a button shoe. <laughs> Mary, Mary, you talk to him. I can't. <laughs> Look, Phil, Jack and I are going for a walk. Do you want to join us or not? Oh, I'd love to, Liv, but when I finish here, I've got to go home and take my uncle to the train. I didn't know you had an uncle here. Yeah, he arrived Tuesday on business. Came out here for the eclipse. <laughs> oh, is he, uh... Is he an astronomer? No, a pickpocket. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jackson, when will you learn to still those quivering lips? <laughs> Come on, Mary, let's go. All right. So long, Phil. So long, Livy, you dove. See you later. Come on, Mary. Hey, uh, Jackson. What? Don't feel bad. You've got the bluest eyes on Wilshire Boulevard. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so long, Phil. Come on, Mary. You know, Mary, Phil kids a lot, but underneath it all, he's really a nice guy. Oh, stop fluttering your eyelashes. Jealous. Now, come on, dollface. We got a long way to walk yet. Come on, Mary. Gosh, what perfect weather. Spring, the skies are clear, the flowers are blooming, the sun is shining. Well, look who's here. Bonjour, Monsieur Benny. Well, Professor LeBlanc, what a surprise running into you. Hello, Professor. Bonjour, mademoiselle. Professor, you certainly look nice today. Is that a new Easter suit you're wearing? Mademoiselle, I am a poor violin teacher. I cannot afford to buy new suits. Well, what do you do with the money I pay you for my violin lesson? I buy sleeping pills. <laughs> Oh, are they, are they any good? No. After a few days, I wake up. <laughs> well, it was nice seeing you, Professor. And don't forget, you're giving me a violin lesson next week. I will not forget. I will tie a string around my finger. Good, good. Better I should tie a rope around my neck. <laughs> what? Goodbye, Monsieur Benny. Goodbye. <laughs> Mary, I can't understand why he hates to give me violin lessons. Well, I can't understand it either. You played beautifully. Well, I... Huh? <laughs> See, Mary, that was sweet. What made you say that? Oh, I don't know. Just an impulse. Yesterday, I kicked a cop in the pants. <laughs> oh, well, sometimes you have to let yourself go, you know. Anyway, Mary, we're certainly running into a lot of people we know, aren't we? Yeah. Say, Geiches. What is it, Mabel? Oh, Gertrude, I feel so elegant walking in the Easter parade. How do you feel? My feet are killing me. But it's my own fault for buying such small shoes. Well, what size did you get? Nine. Oh, well, for heaven's sakes. What's the matter? Getting your footing to a size nine shoe is like docking the Queen Mary in a Dixie cup. <laughs> well, look who's talking. Get a load of your shoes. They're not so big. They're not. Last year when we went on our vacation, every hotel we stopped at pasted labels on them. <laughs> well, it's a natural mistake because my shoes are genuine cowhide. Cowhide? Yeah. From the way your toes stick out, it looks like milk and time. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Gertrude, the next time you talk to me like that, I'll... Hey, Mabel, look, look. Here comes Jack Benny. Oh, yeah. And look who's with her, Mary Livingston. She didn't have to put on airs with me. I remember when she and I worked at the May Company. Oh, did you used to run into her? Very seldom I was a night watchman. <laughs> Look, Mabel, they're coming toward us. <laughs> hello, Don. <laughs> well, hello, Barry. Oh, hello, Jack. I haven't seen you since, uh... Everybody I ran into was asking about you. Oh, really, Jack? Well, what they want to know? Well, they want to know different things like, uh, what you eat for breakfast, what you eat for lunch, what you eat for dinner... What you have for dessert, what you have after dessert, what you eat between meals, what you eat before going to bed at night, all those different things. <laughs> well, that's nice, Jack, but uh, didn't they want to know anything about me on your program? Let's see. Yes, yes, they did, Don. They thought that my last couple of programs weren't quite as funny as usual. They want to know if you ate one of my writers. <laughs> Oh, Jack, I know you're kidding, but I wish you'd stop with that talk. It, it gives everybody the impression I'm fat. All right, Don, I'll stop joking about your size. Say, Don, would you like to walk down Wilshire Boulevard with us? Oh, I'd love to, Mary, but I'm on the other side of the street. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Lift your stomach, Don. Here comes a bus. <laughs> Well, anyway, I'll see you later. Come on, Larry. Hey, Bud. <laughs> Bud. Huh? Come here a minute. <laughs> me? Yeah. Excuse me, Mary. Yeah? <laughs> what are you doing? Well, we're just strolling along in the Easter parade. How far are you going? Uh, to La Brea. That's fine. What? You said you were going to La Brea, and I said that's fine. Well, wait a minute. Aren't you going to try to talk me out of it? Not me. This is my day off. <laughs> oh. Oh. Well, happy Easter. Same to you. Same to you. <laughs> Well, come on, Mary. What happened? Nothing. It's all right. We can go to La Brea. <laughs> come on. Hello, Dennis. Hello, Mary. Well, Dennis. Gee, it's good to see you. Did you have a nice Easter? Oh, sure. I colored Easter eggs all morning, and then I hid them. Uh-huh. And then I told my mother to go look for them. Oh. That must have been fun. No, it was a mess. The eggs splattered all over the walls, the ceiling, and my mother's new dress. Well, Dennis, where did you hide the egg? In the mix, master. <laughs> The mix master? Yeah, it was awful. But Dennis, colored eggs shouldn't splatter. How long did you boil them? Oh, boil them! <laughs> Mary, you take them, will you? <laughs> Dennis, Jack and I are walking down as far as La Brea. Would you like to join us? Oh, sure. I'm not stuck up. Well, that's nice of you. That's sweet of you, kid. Come on, kid. Could you walk a little faster, Mr. Benny? I got to get home and take my uncle to the train. Sure, we can... Your uncle? Yeah, he's here on business. He came Tuesday for the eclipse. Uh, well, uh, Dennis, is he... Mary, Mary, let me take this one. Uh, what did you say your uncle came here for, Dennis? He came here for the eclipse. He came for the eclipse, eh? I know, Dennis, he's a pickpocket. No, he's a photographer and he hasn't got a dark room. <laughs> What? Happy Easter. All right, all right. <laughs> Let's walk on. Say, Dennis, while we're walking along, why don't you sing something? Well, gee, do you think it'd be all right uh, right here on the street? Well, sure. Everybody feels good today. They're all singing. Yeah, they all want you to okay. sing, too. Okay. Happy Easter, everybody. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> The Lucky Strike Program, starring Jack Benny, with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. (laughs) 
Ladies and gentlemen, television is not only here, it's here to stay. And like other stars in radio, Jack Benny is preparing for the future. So now we take you out to Beverly Hills. At the moment, Jack is sleeping while Rochester is going about his morning chores. Well, first I better clean up the living room. Mmm, what a mess. Television sure has Mr. Benny worried. Every night he rehearses a different act. But he's certainly serious about it. Last night he even had a dancing teacher here. Imagine him trying to do that kind of a dance. Oh, well, I might as well pick up his clothes and let the air out of the balloon. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that cute? He even put an ironing board up on two chairs and used it for a runway. <laughs> Let's see, where will I put these balloons? <coughs> oh, hello, Polly. A pretty girl is like a melody. <coughs> oh, oh, were you here last night when Mr. Benny was taking his dancing lesson? <coughs> <laughs> He'll be happy to hear that. Now, Polly, I'll get you some breakfast as soon as I straighten up the... Coming! Coming! Oh, good morning, Mr. Mailman. Good morning, Rochester. Well, there was too much mail to put in the box, so I thought I'd bring it in. Here are the letters. Thank you. And here are Mr. Benny's magazines. Body Beautiful. Uh-huh. Women's Home Companion. Uh-huh. True Story. Uh-huh. Lonely Heart. Uh-huh. And this book, The Manly Art of Self-Defense. Say, I didn't know... Oh, uh, pardon me, that goes to Mike Romanoff. <laughs> Well, I must be getting along. Uh, is that all the mail you have for Mr. Benny? No, I'm still carrying that letter with postage due on it. But I guess there's no use going through that again. <laughs> no, I guess not. How long ago was that letter mailed? I don't know. It was handed down to me by my father. <laughs> well, goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> well, I think I'll take this mail to Mr. Benny's room. It's time he got up anyway. Mr. Benny, it's 11 o'clock. Mr. Benny, wake up. Mr. Benny! Gypsy Rose! A pretty girl. Boss, boss, it's only me. Oh, oh, good morning, Rochester. Uh, What time is it? It's 11 o'clock. I brought you the mail. Do you want to look at it? Oh, yes, give it to me. Aren't you going to put your glasses on? I can't. I broke them last night when I fell off the runway. <laughs> I mean, the ironing board. I mean... The... It's all right, boss. I know. Well, Rochester, take the ironing board down and hide the balloons. I don't want anyone to know about my dancing. Now, let's see the mail. What's this one? Oh, it's from my violin teacher, Professor LeBlanc. Monsieur Benny. As you know, tomorrow I must give you a violin lesson. I will be there unless I catch pneumonia. <laughs> Please excuse the writing, as it is dark here in the deep freeze. (laughs) Hmm. Open the next envelope, Rochester. Yes, sir. Oh, here's a letter from Max Factor. Max Factor? What does he say? Dear Mr. Benny, this is the third letter we have sent you reminding you of your March payment is past due. Either pay it immediately or we'll snatch it off your head. Let him snatch it. It's got moth holes all over it. Let's see. What's this? Hmm, this is from the California Bank. It's another letter about that loan. What are you going to do, boss? I'm going to turn him down. (laughs) (laughs) Now, let's see. Hmm, that's funny. Here's one from the barber shop on the corner. Dear Mr. Benny, we are writing to all of our customers who got shaved here last Saturday. Are you missing an ear? (laughs) P.S. If not called for in 30 days, we will add it to our collection. (laughs) Is there anything else, Rochester? Just the circular. You won't be interested in it. What is it? Yeah. Hmm. Automobile prices reduced. Buy a new car now and save money. Liberal allowances on trade-ins. You know, Rochester, maybe I ought to try and... I'll get it. Oh, oh, say, Rochester, 
No matter who it is, don't mention anything about the new dance I've been working on. I won't. Remember. Coming! Hello, Rochester. Hello, Miss Livingston. Come on in. Mr. Benny home? Yeah, he's getting dressed. He'll be down in a minute. Well, then I'll wait. And don't let me interrupt you, Rochester. Go ahead and finish your ironing. Ironing? Yes, you've got the ironing board up, haven't you? I wasn't using that. You see, Mr. Benny was... Uh Uh-oh. Mr. Benny was what? Well, he was, uh, uh, he was, uh, he was getting ready to wallpaper the living room. Well, back home I used to help my mother paper our house, and Mr. Benny is going at it the wrong way. It seems to me well, that... Well, uh, good morning, Mary. Oh, good morning, Jack. Rochester told me what you were doing with the ironing board. Oh, he did, eh? <laughs> Rochester, I told you not to say anything about what... But, Jack, you should be glad he told me I can show you a few tricks. <laughs> You... What do you know about it? I used to do it with my mother. (laughs) What? Mama was wonderful. She used to work with a brush in each hand. (laughs) A brush in each hand? Well, didn't your father object? No, if she didn't do it, he'd have to. (laughs) Mary... Doll face, what are you talking about? <laughs> wallpapering the house. Oh, oh, wallpapering. Oh, of course. Good boy, Rochester. I'm, I'm going to do that later, Mary, but right now I'm trying to make a big decision. Uh, what big decision? Well, I just received this circular from an automobile company, and I've been thinking maybe I ought to trade in my car and buy a new one. Well, it's about time. What are you going to get, a Chandler or an Essex? <laughs> oh, don't be funny. I'm going to get a real... I'll take it. Hello? Hello, Jackson. I'm calling from the country club. I thought maybe you'd come out and play some golf. Well, I can't today. I'm going out and buy a new car. Operator, operator, you gave me the wrong number. She did not. (laughs) It's me. And I am going to buy a car. Oh, oh. What kind of a car are you going to get, Jackson? Well, I don't know. I I was thinking of getting a Cadillac. Operator, operator, why can't I get the right right number? (laughs) I told you it's me. Oh. He asked me if I wanted to play golf, and I told you I couldn't. Well, look, Jackson, I'm running a picture at my house tonight. Would you like to come over and see it? Gee, I'd love to, but I can't. You see, last night I broke my glasses. Oh, how'd you break them? I fell off the runway. Operator! Operator, I wish you'd give me You got it! You got it! (laughs) Phil, it's me, Gypsy. I mean, Jackson. (laughs) Phil... I'm, I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry I can't play golf with you. Why don't you call Remley? I call Remley. He's right here now. Oh, Frankie's with you, eh? Yeah, he's sitting over there at the table drinking a glass of milk. Operate! Operate! Somebody else is... Oh, no, no, Jack. It's me. It's me. Oh. Well, what's... What's this about Frankie drinking milk? Doctor's orders. Drinking too much bourbon. <laughs> oh, that caused a shortage of calcium in his system. Uh-huh. So the doctor made him drink milk. So Frankie could get more calcium? Yeah, that'll make his teeth stronger. <laughs> Why does he want to strengthen his teeth? So he can pull the corks out of the bourbon bottle. <laughs> what? You can't gum them things, you know. <laughs> I know, I know. Anyway, I'm proud of Frankie drinking milk. Let me talk to him, will you, Phil? Okay. Hey, Frankie. Frankie. Frankie! He can't hear a thing since he got a shave last Saturday. (laughs) Phil, do you mean that... So long, Gypsy. We got eight holes to play. All right. Goodbye, Phil. I can only play 18 holes, but I guess Phil isn't as strong as I am. Uh, Mary, Phil wanted me to play golf with him, but I'm going out and look at some of those new cars. You want to go with me? Oh, sure, Jack. Well, come on, Mary. Let's go downtown and look for a new car. Rochester, we're ready to go. <laughs> Rochester, the traffic's pretty heavy. Take it easy, will you? Uh, Jack, what kind of a car are you going to get? 
I'm not sure, Mary. You know, all the new models look so nice, and they have so many novel features. Like the Nash, for instance. I mean, the way the seats make up into twin beds. You know, maybe that's what I'll get. <laughs> what are you laughing at? You'll have the only car in the country that takes in boarders. <laughs> I wasn't thinking of that, Mary. I just thought that maybe... Say, boss, how long have we been driving? Exactly 14 minutes. You better start looking for a service station. Yeah, no time to lose. Uh, Jack, why do you have to hurry for a service station? Well, you see, Mary, every time the car dries for 15 minutes, the water in the radiator boils over, and then it takes... <laughs> it goes so painful! <laughs> now stop the car, Roger. Well, I guess we'll just have to sit here for a few minutes until it cools off. That's about all. Say, Emily, Emily, isn't that Jack Benny over there? Where? Over there in that Stanley steamer. Ah. <laughs> that isn't a Stanley steamer. It's a Maxwell that blew its top. <laughs> then it is my dream man. Steady, girl, steady. You really have a crush on him, haven't you? Yes, and you know, Emily, I've got a confession to make. Last February, I sent Mr. Benny a Valentine card. Did he get it? He must have. I put it in my laundry bundle. <laughs> oh, does he do your laundry? Yes. Oh, when I think of him ironing my petticoats with his own little hands... <laughs> I break out in goose pimples. <laughs> How romantic. What did you say on your Valentine card? It was a beautiful poem. I wrote it myself. It went, Dear Jack, when I think of you this Valentine's Day, I can throw my vitamin pills away. <laughs> well, I bet he didn't answer it. He did, too. He said, Your lovely poem made me shake and shiver. And starting May 1st, we pick up and deliver. <laughs> Martha, open your eyes. I think they're going to drive off. Rochester, the car should be cool enough now. Let's go. Jack, the street we're coming to is Figueroa. That's Automobile Row. Yeah. Turn right here, Rochester. Yes, sir. Gosh, look at all the automobile dealers on this street. Honest John, the Smiling Irishman, Madman Munts, Psychiatric Sam, <laughs> Wild Man Pritchard. Ah, here's the place we want. Just Plain Bill. <laughs> uh, stop in front of this place, Rochester. Now, Rod... <laughs> You can park down the street a little ways and wait for us. Come on, Mary. Okay. Gosh, Jack, they certainly have some beautiful cars on display here. Yes, I hope this doesn't take too long. I, I wouldn't want Rochester to get a ticket. He can't afford it. <laughs> and besides, I have oh, to... Oh, here comes the salesman. Where? Oh, yes. Oh, mister... Uh, how do you do? Uh, how do you do? I'm thinking of buying a new car. Oh, good, good. Were you thinking of any particular type? Well, uh, would you li like a hydromatic? A hydromatic? Yes, that car comes without a clutch. Look, brother, when I pay for a new car, I want a clutch and everything. <laughs> <laughs> Say, uh, this car here looks pretty good. Yes, Jack, it's really a sporty-looking number. Uh, get inside and see how roomy it is. Okay. It sure is comfortable and... Say, what are these buttons? Oh, oh yes, uh, those are for the windows. I'll, I'll, I'll show you how they work. Gee. Well, didn't you know the new cars had automatic window lifts? He didn't even know they had windows. <laughs> no, please. Uh, what other new features do they have? Well, I'm glad you asked that. This is the only car in the market that comes equipped with a Dynaflex super-flowing Unijet turbovasculator. <laughs> Which is synchromeshed with a multi-coil hydrotension duo vacuum dynamometer. Gosh. Uh, what does that do for the car? It empties the ashtray. <laughs> well, 
that's, that's quite a feature. Uh, Mary, do you think I ought to get this car? Well, certainly. I wouldn't think of having a car that's not equipped with a Dynaflex super-flowing Unijet turbovascular, which is synchro mesh with a multi-coil hydrotension duo vacuum dynamometer. <laughs> dynamometer. <laughs> Mary, you've mispronounced the word with. <laughs> Gee, the, the more I see of this car, the more I like it. But tell me, uh, Mr., uh, Mr... Call me Plain Bill. <laughs> uh, well, look, uh, Plain Bill. <laughs> what are all these other buttons for? Well, they're for the heater, the radio, the lights, and the top. Uh-huh. But what's this red button for? Oh, that red button is for emergencies. Emergencies? Uh, yes, like if you stall the car on the railroad tracks and the train is coming at 100 miles an hour, you press the red button. <laughs> And that gets the car off the track? No, it makes a reservation for you at Forest Lawn. <laughs> hmm. You know, Jack, this is one of the prettiest convertibles I've ever seen. Why don't you take it? I think I will, Mary. Uh, tell me, plain Bill, uh, what's the, um... What's the, what's the price of this car? Uh, four thousand two hundred dollars. Uh, say, Mister, do the windshield wipers on this car squirt water when you press the button? Yes. Well, squirt some on him. He fainted. <laughs> I didn't faint, Mary. Just that four thousand two hundred dollars is a lot of money. But don't forget, we do make liberal allowances on on trade in. Well, my car's right outside. Suppose you come along with us and appraise it. Yes. Well, I, I'd be very glad to. Right this way. Now, uh, uh, which one of these cars is yours? Oh, it's parked down the street a little ways. There it is, right there. You mean that blue Kaiser? No, no, it's behind the Kaiser. Oh, the gray DeSoto? No, no, my car's between the Kaiser and the DeSoto. Here it is. I'll admit it doesn't look like much right now, but a little paint and polish, and she'll be as good as new. What did you get, boss? A convertible or a sedan? Uh, nothing yet. This gentleman is going to appraise ours. Uh, tell me, has this car been in an accident? No. Well, then how come it bulges so much in the rear? Middle-aged spread. Don't be silly. That's the way this car was built. And it has a lot of advantages that the new cars haven't got. Yeah, if you like tea, it boils water every 15 minutes. <laughs> oh, stop. This man is a good judge of cars. Now, plain Bill, uh, get in and I'll, um, I'll show you how it runs. Come on, Mary. Uh, start the car, Rochester. Yes. needs a little... Plain Bill, where are you going? To get a whip and a chair. This thing is dangerous. <laughs> no, no, it'll be all right. Uh, try it again, Rochester. <laughs> See? I, I told you it'd be okay. Do you want me to drive around the block, boss? Uh, just a second. If I am going to appraise this car, I had better drive. No, I'll drive. You shovel the coal. <laughs> better let him drive, Bill. He's more used to it. Well, it's irregular, but okay. See, I told you, it rides very smoothly, doesn't it? Not bad. Uh, now, how much of a trade-in do you think you can give me on it? Well, now, let me see. There's a little rubber on the tires. The body needs a paint job. The upholstery isn't too bad. The motor runs. Look, would the deal include the car's radio? Yes, yes. Now, how much will you allow me on the car, including the radio? Three dollars. <laughs> Three dollars. You better grab it fast, Jack. The ride's made him dizzy. I will not. I wouldn't think of trading in this car for three dollars. It's perfect mechanically. They don't make cars like this today. 
everything built to last for years and gives you excellent service. And all the way... Uh, oh, plain bill. Yes? Lemon or cream? <laughs> Lemon and mine, Mary. Mary! Now, Bill, all kidding aside, how much will you allow me on my car? Three dollars. But this car... There is no use arguing. This thing is without a doubt the oldest, worst, most beat-up piece of junk I have ever seen. What? <laughs> that settles it. Rochester, stop the car. Plain Bill, I'll thank you to get out. Rochester, open the door. That won't be necessary. It fell off. <laughs> well, goodbye to you, sir. Goodbye. Rochester, drive on. Yes, sir. This car is good enough. I can keep it for quite a while yet. You know, boss, if you're not going to get a new car, why don't you have this one fixed up? Put some of those modern things on it. Like what? Like the Dynaflex Super Flowing Unijet Turbo Vasculator, which is simply messed with the... Multi-coil, hydro tension, dual vacuum, dynamometer. <laughs> no, no, then I'd have to go out and buy an ashtray. <laughs> Step on it, Rochester. I want to go home. Jack. You gonna stop off at any other car dealers? No, no, Mary. I've made up my mind. I'm going home. This car will just have to do until I get up. Jack! Jack, what happened? Your hair is gone. It's my fault, Miss Livingston. I never should have driven by a match factor. <laughs> all right, all right. Let him keep it. <laughs> Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, the sportsman, and yours truly, Don Wilson. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, for 16 years I've been introducing the star of our show, and after all those years, you'd think I'd run out of things to say about him. Well, I have. So here he is, Jack Benny. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, Don, that wasn't a very nice introduction. Well, I'm sorry, Jack, but after 16 years, I just couldn't think of anything new. Oh, you couldn't, eh? Well, Don, I'm sure that if I were introducing you, I wouldn't have that trouble. Oh, yes, you would, Jack. You've been saying the same things about me for years. Why, well, I'll bet you can't say anything that I haven't heard before. Oh, yes, I can, Don. What? You're fired. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen... <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, we'll proceed... Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, Jack. You're not serious, are you? Well... You can't fire me. After all, I've got a wife and three chins to support. <laughs> Don, stop worrying. You've been with me for 16 years, and I hope you're with... Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Hello, Don. Hello, Mary. I'm sorry I'm late, Jack, but my car wouldn't start this morning, and I had to take the bus. Oh, that's all right, Well, Don. say, Mary, if your car ever gives you trouble again, why don't you call on me? I'll drive you down. You've seen my new car, haven't you? <laughs> yes, I have, Don, and on you it looks good. It certainly does. By the way, Mary, I understand you called me on the phone yesterday. What did you want? Well, you always like to know when I get letters from my mother, and I got one yesterday. In fact, I brought it with me. Oh, a letter from your mother, eh? Uh-huh. Well, what does the mock kettle of Plainfield <laughs> have to say? Well, just a second, I'll read it to you. Okay. <coughs> 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 my darling daughter, Mary, as you'll notice from the stationery, I'm writing this from the Plainfield Hotel. The reason we're here is because three days ago, we shut the house up and had it fumigated on account of the pests. We got rid of them, all except your Uncle Lou and Cousin Willie. Well, it's about time. We really your don't... Your mother wasn't, didn't start out very funny, incidentally. Go ahead. <laughs> we really don't mind Willie, as he's very little bother. He spends all his time down in the basement with his printing press. 
He has to work night and day because his biggest, biggest competitor is the United States government. Your mother writes them all right. You just can't read them. <laughs> I was blaming the mother. <laughs> Go ahead, Mary. I'm sorry. Oh, there's more. Oh, well. <laughs> anyway, Mary, dear, I kind of like Willie because he's so sweet and thoughtful. Every Mother's Day, he gives me a $10 bill with my picture on it. Oh, I guess I was right in the first place. <laughs> now for a paragraph or two about your sister, babe. Ah, good. This is the part I like. <laughs> Since the warm weather is here, your sister, babe, got herself one of those new French bathing suits. She tried it on yesterday, and I haven't seen so much a babe since the doctor said it's a girl. <laughs> However, she's very happy with the suit. Next month, she's entering a swimming contest. A contest? Gee, I didn't even know that she could swim. Oh, sure, Jack. Babe's a regular mermaid. Well, I've noticed the resemblance, except the, the wrong half looks like a fish. <laughs> I'm funnier than your mother today. Continue with the letter, Mary. Okay. Huh? Uh, Mary, dear, you'll be happy to know that Babe is also taking dancing lessons from Arthur Murray. Well. <laughs> she got a swell deal, too. He teaches her dancing, and she fixes his plumbing. I knew she could do it. You know, Mary, your mother writes some of the funniest letters, though, I've ever heard. Ah, uh, she certainly does, Mary. They're loaded with laughs. Yeah, they're a scream. Oh, hello, Dennis. When did you come in? When they found out Mary's sister Babe was a girl. <laughs> Oh, then you missed the start of the letter. Would you like me to read it to you? Oh, no, I'll hear it on tonight's rebroadcast. Oh, yes, yes. By the way, Dennis, you were off the program last week. Uh, was anything wrong? Oh, no, Mary. Mr. Benny gave me a week off so I could go away for a little vacation. I sure enjoyed myself. I went fishing on Lake Mead. Well, I was the fishing, Dennis. Oh, it was wonderful. Boy, was I lucky. Well, what'd you catch? Four trout, three perch, five bass, and a high-button shoe. <laughs> A high-button shoe? Yeah, but it was too small, so I had to throw it back. <laughs> oh, fine. He bought a shoe. You ought to see the hip boot that got away. <laughs> oh, quiet. I wish I could get away and do a little fishing. That's one of my favorite sports. Fishing? Yeah. Ah, <laughs> oh, what a thrill it is to hook a silvery rainbow trout. One of nature's loveliest creations. What a sight as it breaks the water in a shimmering shower of glistening drops and the sunlight reflecting on its iridescent beauty. Look how he describes the fish. Me, he can't see anything nice. <laughs> Jack, what are you talking about? Nothing, nothing. Say, Dennis, how long were you at Lake Mead? Oh, we were there for a whole week, and I spent all my time out on the boat. A whole week on a boat? A vast there, you landlubber. Larboard the starboard and drop the anchor. Look, Dennis. Give him a timber as a man, the pumps, or we'll all drown like rats. Dennis, that's enough. Ahoy, me hearties, batting the barton and pooping down the poop deck. <laughs> batting the barton? What happened to Durston and Osmond? <laughs> Now, Dennis, that's enough. Do you hear? So that talk, Mr. Christian, or I'll swing you from the highest yard arm of the British fleet. Oh, <laughs> Mary, see what you can do with him, will you? Dennis, Jack is right. Why don't you Let just... Let the men mutiny, my lass, and don't worry. The ship may be rocking and pitching, but I'll sail it through this hurricane or... 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 Dennis, what's the matter? I'm seasick. <laughs> Good, good. Now look, Popeye, it's time for your song. What are you going to sing? Careless Hands. Okay, let's have it. Aye, aye, sir. That was Careless Hands, sung by Dennis Day. Very good, Dennis. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our feature attraction tonight, we are going to do our version of that Warner Brothers picture, The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. And I better cast it right now. I, of course, will play the leading role. Of, of course. course. <laughs> Listen, I'll give a performance that'll... Okay, sit. folks, you're all in clover because Harris is here and this lull is over. Phil, Phil, why do you always have to come in here and ask the audience to applaud? Well, I ain't going to get no laughs with the jokes you give me, and I want to hear some kind of noise. 
laughs. Well, you got no right to complain about the jokes. You get as many laughs on this program as I do. That's what I mean. I want to hear some kind of noise. Applaud me, folks. Bill! Bill! All right, all right. I'll read the stuff that's written here, but I thought a little ad libbing would liven things. Hi, you live. <laughs> Hello, Phil. How are Alice and the children? Oh, fine, Liv, fine. Just left them. You know, this being the first day of May, I drove them over to the park for a big May party. A May party? Yeah, you should have seen all them kids. They looked so cute as they danced around me. Dance around you? Didn't they have a maypole? Yeah, but I was prettier. <laughs> Let me sit down with you, Dennis. I'm seasick, too. <laughs> Phil, you should have seen Mary's letter from her mother. Nice, huh? Yeah, she wrote the letter stuttering. She wrote it that way. <laughs> well, look at Phil. You know, between you and Remley, I've never Wait seen... Wait a minute, you... Jackson. Hold it, Dad. What? Just a minute, bud. I don't care what you say about me, but don't pick on Remley. Phil, Phil, calm down. Yeah, what's wrong? Well, may as well tell you why I've always tried to protect Remley. Yeah. <laughs> what? Well, you see, well, I promised Frankie's poor old mother that I'd always look after him. Oh, when was that? When she threw him out of the house. <laughs> hmm. And I don't like to brag, Jackson, but I've taken pretty good care of Frankie during all these years. Uh, by the way, Phil, it's none of my business, but how much do you pay Frankie? Well, I, I don't give him no regular salary. I, uh, I just take care of his needs, like room, board, and bail. <laughs> oh, fine. Say, Jackson, before I go, there was something I wanted to ask you. Oh, yeah, look, last week you told me you were going to buy a new car. What kind did you get? I didn't get any, Phil, but I may get a new one this summer. Well, look, be sure you get one of them new models that comes equipped with the Dynaflex Superflowing Unijet Turbo Vasculator, which is synchro meshed with the multi-coil, hydro-tension, duo vacuum, dying no matter. <laughs> they come in the modder and fodder model. <laughs> that last word. Listen, that was amazing. I mean, how'd you ever say that? A Harvard man fixes my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> well, I gotta be leaving. So long, kids. So long, Phil. Oh, well. Hey, folks, I'm leaving. You want to throw just one more on me? Phil, get out of here! <laughs> oh, boy, what a character. You know, Jack, Phil is conceited. Conceited? Mary, you should have heard the things he told me yesterday while I was giving him a Tony. <laughs> <laughs> now, where were we? Well, you were casting the play we're going to do. Oh, yes, the treasure of the Sierra Madre. Now, Don, you're going to be my partner when we go hunting for gold. And, Dennis, you're going to be the old prospector, the part that was played by Walter Houston. And let's see, uh, where's Mel Blank? Here I am, Jack. Folks, it's Mel Blank. Give him a big hand. <laughs> We're all going to be in the play. Why don't you just give him applause? Well, Mary, I have to. It's in his contract. You, know? you mean you give money and applause, too? No money, just applause. <laughs> it's amazing, you know, how much you can save when you've got a lot of hams working for you. <laughs> now, Mel, you're going to be the leader of the Mexican bandits. And, oh, yes, Dennis, besides being the old prospector, you'll come in later as one of the bandits. Gee, two parts. It's hard to believe I can sing, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, for our version of Warner Brothers' thrilling adventure story, The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. <laughs> As our scene opens, it's a hot, humid, sultry day. A lonely, hungry, penniless American is roaming the streets of Tampico, Mexico. Walking. Walking. That's all I've been doing for two whole days. Just walking. No place to sleep. Nothing to eat. Nothing to drink. 
Well, I'll see what I can do in this saloon. See, this place is crowded. Hey, bartender. Bartender. Hey, si, senor. What will you have? Give me three fingers. Hey, three fingers of what? Just three fingers. I'm hungry. <laughs> Give me three fingers of anything. If I don't get something to eat pretty soon, I'll go crazy. Hi, uh, big boy. Huh? Oh, it's good to see an American down here, even though you do need a shave and your clothes are torn. You look like a derelict. What's the matter? It's a long story. I used to be a famous radio comedian. I had a big house, a swimming pool, and everything. And all of a sudden, I'm a bum. What happened? Television. <laughs> Television? What's that? I don't know, but the wrestlers have all the good writers now. <laughs> Let's not talk about me. That's a girl like you doing way down here in Mexico. I work in the Tampico branch of the May Company. <laughs> they have a branch in Mexico? Yeah, I'm in the Jose department. <laughs> That's better than your mother's letter. <laughs> well, look, sister... How about you and hey, me? Hey, Bogey. Bogey, I've been looking all over town for you. Who's your friend? That's my partner, Curtin. Sam Curtin. He and I came down here looking for gold. Yeah, gold. Every time I think of it, I go crazy. Gold! Gold! I can see it now. There it is. There it is. It's mine! It's mine! Gold! Gold! Put that back. That's my pivot tool. <laughs> you know, sister... He goes crazy every time he thinks of gold. Well, doesn't gold mean anything to you? Yeah. I can take it or love it. I mean, leave it. Well, you boys are interested in looking for gold. There's an old prospect around here who knows every foot of the Sierra Madre. If you can get him to go with you, you'll strike it rich. Where does the old prospector live? Well, you can't miss it. You go right down Flamingo Road. Flamingo Road. Flamingo Road. Flamingo Road. Are you stuttering? No, but I promised Warner Brothers I'd mention it three times. <laughs> Come on, Curtin. Let's go. Hey, Curtin, this must be the house where the old prospector lives. Yeah, knock on the door. Okay. Howdy, Bob. Timer, my name is Humphrey Bogey. What's yours? Titus Houston. Well, well, we've heard that you know all about the gold and the Sierra Madre, and we thought maybe you'd come up into the mountains with us. Sorry, son, but I'm too old for that now. There was a time when I used to go up into them hills and stay for months and months at a time. Uh -huh. Then it would get me. I was only human, you know. I'd have to come back, be back in town with a load of gold, and in a couple of nights, I'd blow it all in. Women, eh? No, Kleenex. I got hay fever. <laughs> well, look, old-timer, if you won't go with us, maybe you can tell us where we can find the gold. Sure. Here's a map of old Mexico. See? You can't go wrong. You take the main road through Tampico till you pass El Paso. After you pass El Paso, you go through El Truo and turn left at El Lefto. Well, if we turn El Rido. That's El Rongo. <laughs> Is that where the gold is? Nope. That's where you buy your burrows. Burrows? Yep. There's a place right on the corner. Madman Hernandez. <laughs> and he'll sell them to us? Yep, but you'll have to carry an awful lot of water for them. Why? Hernandez wanted his burrows to look like Buicks, so he cut holes in their sides. <laughs> oh, well, we got to be getting along, old timer. You sure you don't want to come with us? Nope, but I'll see you later. You will? Yep, I come back on page 12 as a Mexican bandit. <laughs> well, come on, Curtin. Let's go. What's the matter, Bogey? You look unhappy. Well, why shouldn't I be? 
We've got the map. We know where the gold is, but we can't get it because we don't have any money to buy equipment. Oh, senor, senor. Huh? In there, in the saloon, there is a telephone call for you. In there, for you. In the saloon. In there. Huh? For you. <laughs> for me? In there. Is it an important call? <laughs> See, an important call. For you. A telephone call for me. Who could it be? I'm 2,000 miles away from home. Well, I might as well find out. Come on, Curtin. Wait for me at the bar, Curtin. I'll answer the phone. Okay. Hello? Yeah, speaking. Huh? Sure I can answer that. The Pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock in 1620. Thank you. Goodbye. Hey, Curtin! Curtin! What's up, Bogey? We got the burrows, the picks, the shovels, the sleeping bags, and a refrigerator. Where'd you get them? That phone call. I just won them on a quiz program. <laughs> Tacos or leave it. Good. Now let's go and find that gold. All right. Before we go, I want to buy drinks for the house. Okay, everybody. The drinks are on me. Hooray! Come on, everybody. Up to the bar. You know, Curtin, we've been digging in these mountains for weeks, but it was worth it. We got ten sacks of gold. Yeah, ten more sacks, and then we... Wait a Look, coming up the trail. Mexican bandits. Curtin, quick, take out your gun. But I haven't got a gun. What? What did you say, Curtin? I haven't got a gun. Ah, oh, that's ridiculous. Who ever heard of a Curtin without a rod? <laughs> Thank you. Hey, that was pretty... Quiet, quiet. Here they come now. Oh, yeah. Look, Curtin, they're getting off their horses. They're walking this way. Well, we'll just have to try and bluff them. Hey, you. Come here. Are you a Mexican bandit? Si. I suppose your men are tough. Si. I guess they would kill us at a drop of a hat. Si. What's your name? Si. Sai? Si. Now look, see. I mean, Sai. We don't have anything you want. We're we're hunters. That's all we are. You do not fool me. You have some gold and we want it. If you don't give it to us, we will kill you. I think. <laughs> Look, me and my partner have been out in these mountains for three months. Yeah, we found some gold. But don't take all of it. Let us keep half. That's a fair proposition, isn't it? We'll give you a half. I will talk it over with my lieutenant. Oh, Henry. Henry Sierra. Coming, madre. <laughs> what is it then, Capitan? The gentleman here with the gold made a proposition. Oh, see? Si? What is it? Estos personas dicen que si no los matamos, ellos nos darán la mitad de del oro. Si los matamos, tendríamos que cagar con todo. Por lo tanto, con ya usted o el oro, matarlo después. What did he say? What did he say? He said you better give us the gold because these eight guns make common sense. <laughs> no, no, Baggio. Please, don't shoot us. We'll give you the gold. El Capitan, if we take the gold, we will need a burro. Sí, we will take the little burro. It is equipped with the Dynaflex Super Flowing Uni Jet Turbo Rascillator, which is synchromesh with the multi coil aero tension duo vacuum dynamometer, I think. Look back. Take our gold. Take our burrows, but don't kill us. I will tell you what I do, senor. I give you a fighting chance. Here's a weapon for you and a weapon for me. What? You count to ten and may the best hombre win. All right. All right, I'll come. One, two, three. Ooh, not yet. Four, five, six. Ooh, wait a minute. Seven, eight. Ooh, you're cheating. I think. Nine, ten. You missed me. That's better. Ooh. Bogey, 
Bogey, when he started shooting, why didn't you shoot back? I couldn't. He gave me a knife. <laughs> Goodbye, Curtin. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes another program, and we'll be with you again oh, next Jack. Sunday night when we... Huh? Jack. What? Huh? While you were doing the sketch, a wire came for you from Humphrey Bogart. From who? Humphrey Bogart. Not from Humphrey Bogart? <laughs> Mary, yeah. what's the matter with you today? A wire came to me from Humphrey Bogart? Yes. Well, read it to me. This wire you don't read. You twist it around your neck. Oh, <laughs> The Lucky Strike Program, starring Jack Benny, with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, on last Sunday's broadcast, we presented our version of the great Warner Brothers picture, The Treasure of Sierra Madre. Immediately after that, the orchestra played our theme song. As we went off the air, here's exactly what happened. All right, Bill, hold it. Bill, hold it. We're off the air. Tell your boys to stop. Hey, that's enough, fellas. Stop. Cut. Quit already. All right, boys, go home. Stop it. Sammy, stop. Now, look, I don't want anybody to leave the stage. I want to talk to the entire cast. Is there anything wrong, Mr. Benny? Yes, there's plenty wrong, Dennis. Now, look, I don't want to get mad. I don't want to lose my temper. But the broadcast we just finished was one of the sloppiest shows I've ever heard. Everyone fluffing their lines, missing their cues. Well, all right, Jack, it's over. Let's forget it. We won't forget it, Mary. In fact, I want to talk to you first. To me? Yes. I can't understand what happened to you when you read your mother's letter. I haven't heard you get words so mixed up since that time in the restaurant when you ordered a chip sweet sandwich. <laughs> no, really, it was awful. Well, I, I'm sorry, Jack, but I just couldn't help it. Yesterday, the dentist put a new gold crown on one of my teeth, and it bothers me when I speak. Look, Mary, I don't want any excuses. I'm just telling you that a gold crown? <laughs> yes. What happened to your old one? You kissed me and it melted. <laughs> Gee, I didn't know. I... Oh, don't be funny. <laughs> and now for you, Phil. During the program, you made a mistake that almost ruined a big laugh. I did? Yes. You were supposed to... Look, Phil. You were supposed to say that your new car came equipped with a Dynaflex super-flowing unijet turbovasculator, which is synchromesh with the multi-coil hydrotension dual vacuum dynamometer. Uh-huh. But instead of that, instead of that, Phil, you said your new car came equipped with a Dynaflex super-flowing unijet turbovasculator which is synchromesh with a multi-coil hydrotension dual vacuum dynamama mater. Imagine dynamama mater. I said that? You certainly did. Holy smoke, and I stayed on the wagon all week to get that line right. Well, I'll give you one more chance, Bill. Read it now. Jackson, I wouldn't read that line again if you name me in your will. A will? What's that? That's when you leave your money to somebody. Whoever started a silly thing like that. <laughs> now, let's see. Uh, who else made a mistake? Oh, yes, Dennis. Go ahead. Whip me, beat me, torture me, but I'll carry on. Laugh, clown, laugh. <laughs> Dennis, stop that. Okay. Did I do something wrong on today's show, Mr. Benny? Yes, you did, Dennis. 
In our skit, The Treasure of the Sierra Madre, I let you play two parts, didn't I? Yes, sir. But when you play the old prospector, you put in a line that wasn't even in the script. Yes, sir. You said, so long, I'll see you on page 12 when I come back as a Mexican bandit. <laughs> Didn't you? Si, senor. <laughs> now, if it wasn't in the script, why did you say you were coming back later? Well, my mother was listening, and I didn't want her to tune out. <laughs> Wait a minute. You mean your mother only listens to the part of the program that you're on? Yeah, she thinks you're awful. <laughs> Look, Dennis. She said if you didn't have the mortgage on our house, she'd slap your silly face. <laughs> all right, all, I didn't keep you here to discuss my real estate holding. The, 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 the point I'm trying to make is this. If there's going to be any more ad-libbing on this program, I'll be the one to do it. Oh, fine. What? You couldn't add lib there off if you were at the Kentucky Derby and your suspenders broke. <laughs> suspenders broke, suspenders broke. Mary, don't be so smart. You can be replaced, you know. There are plenty of other girls in the May Company that can read lines. <laughs> now, kids, I wasn't bawling you out. I just want you to be a little more careful. Well, That's Jack, it. you didn't say anything to me. Does that mean I read my lines right? Yes, son, you read your lines perfectly. But I do have one little complaint about the way you stand on the stage. What do you mean? Well, when the sportsman quartet came on to do their number, you were standing in front of the microphone blocking them. Now, you should have stepped aside. But, Jack, I did step aside. No, no, Don. The part that had legs stepped aside. The rest of you stayed. <laughs> now, watch it next time, pear shade. <laughs> Hey, gang, how about all of us going over to the drugstore for a sandwich? That is, if Mr. Benny has concluded the chastisement of his fellow thespian. <laughs> Phil, did that, uh, did that come out of you? Certainly. What's so unusual about me knowing words of more than one cylinder? That cylinder! <laughs> a cylinder is something round and hollow, like your head. <laughs> now, kid, you go to the drugstore, and I'll meet you at the <laughs> I got to go to my dressing room and change. Gee, I hated to ball them out, but I just had to. I hope I wasn't too harsh with them, especially Phil. He's so sensitive. Oh, hello, Rochester. Oh, hello, boss. I didn't know you were in my dressing room. What are you doing with that typewriter? Just what you told me to do. I'm making out the weekly payroll. Oh, yes. You go ahead and finish while I change clothes. Yes, sir. Mary Livingston and 40 cents. Oh, Rochester, where are my shoes? Uh, under the couch. Bill Harris and 30 cents. I don't see my shoes. Oh, yes, here they are. Don Wilson and 50 cents. Rochester, Van Jones, and 12 cents. Hey, Rochester, have you made out Dennis Day's salary check yet? Uh, no, boss, I'm just coming to it. Oh, good. I want you to add $2 to Dennis's check. Well, that's nice. Did you give him a raise? No, we burned one of his shirts ironing it. <laughs> so while you're at it, deduct a dollar from your check and a dollar from mine. Next time we won't be so careless. <laughs> By the way, Rochester, do you have the radio on? Uh -huh. Were you listening to my program? Uh huh. What'd you think of it? We better stop burning shirts. <laughs> You're right, Rochester. Well, I'm all dressed. Step aside, please. I want to use the mirror. Okay. Uh, here's your comb, boss. Thanks. Here's your hair. <laughs> Thanks. Gee, I look tall. Take the old one off first. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, 
Well, I'm going, Rochester. And before you leave, hang my clothes up in the closet, will you please? Yes, sir. You know, it was nice of CBS to pick up this dressing room for me and put in all this plumbing. Boss, the plumbing was here. They just built the dressing room around it. <laughs> Oh, then I guess the whisk room was left over, too. <laughs> well, see you later, Rochester. So long. Uh-oh. Uh, Rochester, while you're at the typewriter, I wish you'd jot down the words, they're off. They're off? What's that, boss? It's something I want to ad lib in case my suspenders ever break at the Kentucky Bird. <laughs> So long. Oh, boss, boss. What is it, Rochester? I forgot to tell you while you were on the air, Mr. Hooper called. Hooper? You're telling me you were listening to my program? He didn't care about that. He called about his shirts. <laughs> oh, well, they won't be ready till Monday. Gee, I remember the time I burned Mr. Hooper's shirt. My rating went down to 9.2. <laughs> or was it 2.9? <laughs> oh, well, that was weeks ago. Now my rating is back to 11. Or is it 1.1? 1. 1? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Drugstore is always so crowded. Yeah, but they know me here. We'll get served right away. Watch. I prepared this as soon as you came in, Mr. Harris. Here's your bromo seltzer. <laughs> Thanks. Shall I put two straws in it, or isn't Mr. Emily with you? <laughs> now, wait a minute, bud. I don't want no bromo seltzer. Oh, I'll drink it. Dennis, why do you need a bromo? I went to a party last night, Liv. <laughs> a party? Boy, oh, boy. <whistles> Did we have fun. You play spin the bottle, post office, hide and go seek, and sisters as I get stiff. What? I hid in the deep freeze and nobody found me. <laughs> if you folks would like to sit at the counter, there are three empty seats now. The waiter will take care of you. Oh, yeah. Come along, Miss Livingstone. <laughs> <laughs> Just a minute, Phil. I'm buying a magazine. Okay, I'll go over and hold this seat. Here's your change, Miss. Well, thank you. Come on, Dennis. Well, just a minute, Mary. I'm weighing myself. Oh, boy, look at this little card that came out. Well, what does the card say? Go to the races. You may get hot at Hollywood Park. <laughs> oh, Dennis. Come on. Right over here, Libby. Say, Phil, look. There's an article in this Cosmopolitan about Jack, and it's written by Eddie Cantor. No kidding. What does it say? Oh, that's his opening line. Contrary to the miserly character he assumes on the radio, Jack Benny in real life is the most generous man I've ever met. <laughs> Eddie Cantor wrote that about Jackson? Hey, Libby, read it again, will you? <laughs> Contrary to the miserly character he assumes on the radio, Jack Benny in real life is the most generous man I've ever met. Let me see that magazine, baby. Contrary to the miserly character he assumes on the radio, Phil. Jack Benny in real life Phil. is the most generous man I ever met. And, Phil. Huh? You got the magazine upside down. <laughs> All right, so I memorized it. <laughs> but imagine anyone saying that Jackson is generous. Well, I think Mr. Benny is very generous. When I first went to work for him, he only paid me $35 a week. What are you getting now? 37 <laughs> Oh, I gave you a raise. No, he burned one of my shirts. <laughs> oh, Dennis, what are you... Mm -mm -mm. Uh-oh, I gotta leave you, kid. There's Remley. Mm -mm -mm. Well, I didn't know Remley had a car. That ain't no car. He's got a cold. So long, kid. <laughs> the menu so we can... Dennis, where is that kid? Dennis! Oh, I'm over here by the jukebox. Would you like to hear my recording of Little Mother of Mine? Oh, I'd love to. Okay. Oh, that was a nice record, Dennis. I liked it very much. 
So did everybody in the drugstore. They all applauded. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they all applauded. Here I am, kids. Did you order yet? Oh, not yet, Jack. We're waiting for you. Oh, good, good. I'll get the menu. Oh, waiter. Waiter. <laughs> we have a menu, please? Certainly. Here you are. Thanks. Now, let's see. Oh, waiter, why have you got all those steering wheels attached to the counter? Those are for people who like to eat in drive-ins and can't afford cars. <laughs> cars? The one on the end is a convertible. What? If you press the button, the roof comes down. Oh, be quiet! Why do I always run into this crazy guy? I don't know what I want to eat. Dennis, what are you going to order? A hamburger sandwich and check my oil. <laughs> Dennis, stop going along with the waiter. Now, let's see. What do I want? Yeah, are you people going to order, or are you waiting for the floor show? A floor show in a drugstore? Yes. At 8 o'clock, Dr. Scholl comes out and does a fan dance with two foot pads. <laughs> Dr. Scholl? He's corny, but he's good. <laughs> Take our orders, and that's all. We'll have three hamburgers. Now, go get them. Oh, wait a minute, Jack. I don't want a hamburger. Well, you can have anything you like. What do you want? A kiss sweet sandwich. <laughs> I knew it! I knew it! I knew it! Stop yelling at the girl. We make wonderful kiss sweet sandwiches. <laughs> you do? Yeah. Well, then, I'll try a kiss sweet sandwich. <laughs> Would you like me to crim the truss? <laughs> I don't know why I ever come in this place. The service is awful. The waiter... So... Oh, for heaven's sake, look at that. Waiter, come back here. Now what? Now what? Look at this glass. There's lipstick on it. Well, there's water in it. Wash it off. <laughs> Wash it off yourself. <laughs> you know, Mary, I've never seen such a fresh waiter in all my life. Hey, mister, would you mind moving your elbow so I can get the sugar? I don't know why I come in here anyway. We never can get a booth. We always have to sit at the counter. Mister, would you move your elbow so I can get the sugar? Believe me, Mary, it's the last time I'm ever... Hey, look, bud, I'm trying to get the sugar. What? Would you mind lifting your blockade or do I have to wait till May the 12th? Oh, I'm sorry. Here you are. Now, Mary, as soon oh, as we... Oh, Jack, Jack, look who just came in. Who? Well, what do you know? Eddie Tanner. Eddie, Eddie, come here. Hiya, Jack. Hello, Mary. <laughs> well, sit down, Eddie. Have a sandwich or something. Thanks, Jack. Eddie, you know Dennis Day. Sure, sure. Hello, Dennis. Well, Eddie Camper, how do you do? <laughs> Stop. Come on, Eddie. What are you going to have? Well, I'm not very hungry, but wait, uh, I'll have a sandwich, uh, chicken sandwich and an ice cream soda. They're very good, sir. What flavor? The usual. A glass of Pat Blue Ribbon with a scoop of vanilla ice cream. Eddie, ice cream and beer? Look, Jack. Well, he eats his own, I guess. Say, Eddie, that was a nice article you wrote about Jack and the Cosmopolitan. It certainly was, Eddie, and I want to thank you. It was a very honest piece. I'm glad you liked it, Jack. Did you read the part where I said, contrary to the miserly character he assumed on the radio, Jack Benny in real life is the most generous man I've ever met? Yes, I did, Eddie, and only a man like you, who has known me all my life, can appreciate the finer side of my character. Hey, Mary, you want to split a bromo seltzer? <laughs> No, my head's all right. It's my stomach that bothers me. <laughs> Mary, please. Mary, you may think I'm exaggerating about Jack's generosity, but I'll never forget that day in 1928 when he first played the Palace Theater in New York. After the opening performance, Jack walked into Lindy's restaurant and yelled, Okay, fellas, I'll buy drinks for everybody. Buy drinks in 1928? Prohibition wasn't repealed until 1933. Jack was willing to wait. <laughs> Yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah, Here's your orders. Will there be anything else? No, thanks. That'll be all. Say, Eddie, speaking of the palace in New York, remember the fun we used to have in Vaudeville together? Oh, yeah. Jack, (laughs) remember the time? (laughs) What? What, Eddie? What? What? Remember the time you made a blind date over the phone and you asked the girl if she could bring a friend for me? And she said, yes, she'd bring a sister? Yeah. She had to. They were Siamese twins. <laughs> yeah, they were invaluable too. They had a great act. They were their names were Doris and Dorothy Ace. They were billed as aces back to back. <laughs> Dennis, I'll have that bromo seltzer now. Gosh, Eddie, those were the days. Good old boy. We used to see a lot of each other then. Oh, yeah. Say, look, Jack, why don't you and Mary come over to my house for dinner next Saturday night? Oh, I'd love to, Eddie. Me too. Good. You see, it's my birthday, and we're having a few friends over. Your birthday, eh? How old are you going to be, Eddie? Uh... <laughs> no, come on, Eddie. Tell me. What's the difference? How old are you going to be? How old am I going to be? What's the use of kidding, Jack? Everyone else... I can lie to, but not you. You know my right age. You know I'm even older than you. Well, I know, I know, but how old are you going to be? (laughs) Forty. Well, me next. (laughs) Say, Eddie, I was just wondering, how old, now this is just between you and me, you know, how old do you think Al Jolson? I don't know, but Ida is his daughter. (laughs) No kidding. Well, I've got to run along, Jack. Oh, waiter, waiter. Uh, My check, please. Oh, no, no. Wait a minute, Eddie. Get your hand out of your pocket. Huh? I asked you to sit here. This is on me. No, 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 Jack. You were here already, and I horned in. Waiter, give me my check. Oh, no, you don't. Look, Eddie, we've been friends for years. You wrote this wonderful article about me, and now you want to spoil the whole thing. Waiter, how much is Mr. Cantor's check? It's 65 cents. After all, Eddie, I... Sixty-five cents? For what? All we had was a chicken sandwich and a glass of beer. Jack, I'll pay for it. You will not. He wrote the article about me. (laughs) Oh, look, waiter, how can this bill be sixty-five cents? All he had was a chicken sandwich and a glass of beer. If he had the beer, why are you foaming at the mouth? Out of this. Now, waiter, this is outrageous. It's highway robbery. Jack, Jack, don't make a scene. Let me have the check for heaven's sake. I will not. You're my guest. All right, waiter, it's a hold-up, but I'll pay it. Can you change a $50 bill? I can change it. You shut up! <laughs> Jack, it's me, Eddie, the one who wrote all those nice things about you. Like I said in my article, Jack Benny is the most generous man I've ever... You can stop with that already, too. I don't mind being generous, Eddie. But when you first came in here, you said you weren't hungry. Then you sat here and stuffed yourself. <laughs> up a 65-cent bill. <laughs> well, flattery won't get you anywhere, Mr. Tander. Here's your check. Come on, Mary, let's go. But Jack, Jack! How do you like that guy? He's gone. Well, I'm glad. Waiter, how much did you say that check was? 65 cents? No, it's three dollars and a quarter. What? He didn't pay his either. <laughs> well, this is a fine how do you do. How do you do? Shut up! <laughs> Happy Mother's Day and good night, everybody. The Lucky Strike program, starring Jack Benny, with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilkes. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let's go out to Jack's home in Beverly Hills. Jack and Rochester are puttering around the kitchen, and at the moment, they're defrosting and cleaning out their refrigerator. Well, it's all wiped out, Rochester. Now, put the butter back first. Yes, sir. Say, boss, what do you want me to do with this leftover roast beef? Uh, Save it. We'll make hash out of it. How about this leg of lamb we had last Thursday? Mm, Save that, too. We'll make hash out of it. What shall I do with this leftover roast pork? Mm, 
didn't save it. We'll make hash out of that, too. Well, what shall I do with this 30 pounds of leftover hash? <laughs> uh, save it. We'll make stew out of it. Well, I had you that time. Yeah, yeah. Wait a minute. What's in that? What's in what? In that round, flat can in the freezing compartment. Oh, I just put that in there since the weather got hot. What is it? The film of the horn blows at midnight. <laughs> well, take it out. And put it in this package. I want to store it there all summer. Say, that's a mighty big package. What's in it? Uh, Miss Livingston's fur coat. <laughs> I made her a better deal than I.J. Fox. <laughs> Well, that's about all, Rochester. You can close the refrigerator. Yes, sir. Oh, Rochester, open the refrigerator again. I want to take out some ham for a sandwich. It's too late, boss. The time lock is set for tomorrow morning. <laughs> Gee, and I'm so hungry. Oh, by the way, uh, Professor LeBlanc is coming over pretty soon to give me a violin lesson. So I better get... I'll get it, boss. Mr. Benny's residence, star, stage, screen, radio, and remember our slogan. During the summer, you can save some cash by storing your furs right next to our hash. <laughs> hmm. Hello, may I speak to Mr. Jack Benny, please? Just a moment, miss. It's for you, boss. Thanks. Hello? Mr. Benny, this is Betty Stewart of the Associated Press. Associated Press? Yes. Last week in a press interview, Fred Allen said that if you're as bad on television as you are on radio, people will receive your program on a 10-inch airway. <laughs> oh, uh, Fred Allen said that, huh? Yes. Now, the Associated Press wants to know if you'd like to make any comment about Mr. Allen. I certainly would. Uh, put a man on the phone. <laughs> oh, that's quite all right, Mr. Betty. I'm used to that kind of language. <laughs> I used to work in a bingo parlor. Oh. Now, do you have anything you'd like to say about Mr. Allen? Yes. Uh, you can quote me as saying, the reason Fred Allen doesn't go on television is because he doesn't want to spoil an illusion. An illusion? Yes. On the radio, everybody thinks he's alive. <laughs> Unquote. Goodbye. Goodbye. Who is that, boss? The Associated Press. One of our competitors? No, no, Roger. That's a newspaper. They don't press clothes. <laughs> uh, they gather news for all the... Come in. Oh, hello, Phil. Hiya, Jackson. What'd you say, Chester? Hello, Mr. Harris. <laughs> Phil, what are you doing around here? Well, Jackson, there's something I want to talk to you about. Oh, what is it? Well, I'd, I'd like to talk to you alone. Rasha, would you mind leaving the room? Okay. Uh, what do you want to talk to me about, Phil? Close the other door, will you? Sure. Uh, what is it, Phil? Jackson, uh, I want to borrow some money. <laughs> How, how much? Two thousand dollars. You know, Phil... <laughs> <laughs> you know, Phil, life is funny. <laughs> you know, if we were doing a radio program now and you came in and asked me for two thousand dollars, I'd have to turn you down with a joke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but now we're not on the radio, so I can turn you down without a joke. <laughs> Isn't life funny? But, Jackson, now, wait a minute. You can't turn me down. I gotta have $2,000. So what in the world do you need all that money for? Well, after we go off the air this summer, I'm going on tour with my orchestra. On tour? Yeah, and we're going to go to Texas, then Louisiana, then through Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia. Why are you only going through the South? Look, Dad, I only know one song, and I ain't taking no chances. <laughs> well, well, Phil, what do you need the $2,000 for? I mean, traveling expenses? No, no, no. That's all taken care of. But I promised all my boys I'd buy them new tuxedos. Well, it's about time. At least they'll look nice while they're playing. Huh? Oh, no. They ain't going to wear them on the bandstand. They're going to use them to pick up extra money during the daytime. <laughs> tuxedos in the daytime? Yeah, they double as pallbearers. <laughs> no. Sure. And Remley's in great demand. 
Remley as a, as a pallbearer? Why? Both of his arms are on the same side. <laughs> Funny, I never noticed that while he was playing the guitar. I mean, well, look, Phil, I'd like to lend you the money, but... Uh... Now, wait a minute, Jackson. Wait a minute. Now, I'm not asking this as a friend. I'm willing to make it the regular business deal. I'll sign papers and everything. Oh. Well, would you be willing to put up security? Yeah. But not like the last time. We missed the kids. <laughs> All right, Phil, you don't have to put up security. Just sign the papers as usual. Oh, Rochester! Rochester! What is it, boss? Uh, Mr. Harris is going to sign a legal agreement. Uh, bring me a sheet of paper, a pen, and a sharp knife. Yes, sir. All right, Phil, roll up your sleeve. <laughs> oh, Jackson, can I sign an ink this time? <laughs> Well, okay, you've been with me a long time. I'll go down to my vault to get the money. You write out an I.O.U. A what? An I.O.U. How do you spell it? <laughs> Rochester will show you. I'll be back in a few minutes. I'm going down to the vault. in the motor. So playful. <laughs> I hope the drawbridge is strong. or foe? Friend. What's the password? You can take it with you. <laughs> oh, it's you, Mr. Benny. Yes. How are you, Ed? Fine, fine. Glad you came down, Mr. Benny. I haven't had a chance to thank you for my Christmas present. <laughs> Did you did you like it, Ed? It's the nicest calendar I ever had. <laughs> good, good. And Ed, isn't that a pretty picture on it? Yes. What is it? It's a girl. Oh. <laughs> and uh, what's that thing she's holding? Oh, that's a telephone. Oh. That's a girl, and that's a telephone. Yes. It was invented in 1876. The girl? No, no, no. <laughs> The telephone. Oh. Now, excuse me, Ed. I'd like to open the safe. Should I commit suicide? <laughs> no, no, Ed. Just close your eyes. That's all. <laughs> now, let's see. Right to 45. Left to 60. Back to 15. And left to 110. There. <laughs> That reminds me, I must ask Phil what he's going to play on the program. <laughs> now, let's see. Um, Phil wants $2,000. I'll take $2 for my violin teacher. And I better take an extra five. I may go to Las Vegas for the weekend. <laughs> there. Well, goodbye, Ed. Take care of yourself. I will. Oh, by the way, Mr. Benny, would you mind mailing this letter for me? No, no, not at all. It's very important. Would you put it on the pony yourself? <laughs> huh? Oh, no, Ed. They, they take it by trains now and aeroplanes. I'll explain it to you later. So long, Ed. Goodbye, Mr. Benny. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh, Phil! Phil! Here I am, Jackson, right over here, right in front of you. Oh, my eyes haven't got used to the light yet. <laughs> hey, here's your money. Thanks, Jackson, I really appreciate it. You're welcome, but don't forget, I want it back in 90 days. So long, Phil. So long, Giannini. <laughs> yeah, I hope Phil doesn't borrow money from me too often. He can't afford the interest. Oh, well, that's his worry. Uh, Say, boss, while you were down in the vault, Professor LeBlanc's wife called and said he wouldn't be able to come over and give you your violin lesson. Why not? She said he sprained his ankle and can't go out. Oh, well, gee, I don't want to miss my lesson. I'll go over to his house. Rochester, I'll get my violin. You get the car. You can't use the car, boss. The two front wheels are out of line. Are they much out of line? I think so. One's in the garage and the other's on Wilshire Boulevard. <laughs> Oh, well, then I'll take the streetcar. I'll get my violin now and... Oh, darn it, just when I'm in a hurry. Come in. Well. Hiya, Jack. Hoagie. Hoagie Carmichael. <laughs> well, Hoagie, this is quite a surprise. What brings you around here? Well, Jack, I won't take up much of your time. I just thought maybe you'd like to buy a song. By a song? Mm-hmm. What's a man like you, Hoagie Carmichael, doing, going around from door to door selling songs? Well, Jack, it's a long story. Remember that night three years ago at the Academy Awards when Sam Goldwyn called me Hugo? Yeah. Well, ever since then, Hugo became a sensation. <laughs> what about Hoagie? He's a bum. <laughs> Wait a minute, don't tell me Hoagie Carmichael, the man who wrote Stardust and Old Buttermilk Sky, can't sell a song. I can't understand it either, Jack, and I have some wonderful new ones. I just finished a beautiful love song called She Didn't Realize He Was Alive Till He Got Him Alone on Mulholland Drive. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, I heard that. Then I wrote another one called I Bought a Television Set for My Girl and Now She's in Love with Milton Burrow. <laughs> Very good, very good. Yeah, then I wrote another song that was very topical. What's the name of it? Everything is strictly kosher since the Giants got back Leo DeRocher. <laughs> and, that... and that song isn't popular? It struck out on the hit parade. <laughs> Gee, that's a shame. Yeah, I got a new one I brought along with me, and I want you to listen to it. Well, Hoagie, what makes you think I'll be interested in it? Well, just let me sing it for you, and you'll know the reason why. I've got the music right here. Well, good. I'll get my violin and accompany you. Wait a minute, Jack. It's a new song. Give it a fighting chance. <laughs> okay, okay. Come on, let's hear it, Hoagie. <laughs> Gee, Hoagie, that was really swell. Uh, thanks, Jack. Uh, would you like to buy that song? Well, I haven't got time to discuss it right now. You see, I've got to catch the streetcar and go take a violin lesson. Oh. Well, call me tomorrow, Hoagie. Okay. So long, Jack. So long. <laughs> uh, Rochester, Rochester, I'm going to take my lesson now. I'll be home for dinner. <laughs> Step to the rear of the car, please. Uh, pardon me. Hey, wait a minute, bud. Huh? Did I get your fare? Oh, oh my fare. Uh, here's a transfer. Say, uh, you're Jack Benny, aren't you? Yes, yes. You were in London, England last summer, weren't you? Yes. Yeah, how did you know? This transfer you gave me is from the Piccadilly Bus Company. <laughs> I, I didn't mean to give you that one. That was a mistake. Here's a dime. Thanks. I'll, uh... I bet you're surprised to see a celebrity like me riding a streetcar. Nah. When they're on their way down, they save every way they can. <laughs> what? Step to the rear of the car, please. Step to the rear of the car. All right, all right. Let me know when it's West 6th Street. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Hello, Mr. Benny. Huh? You can sit here by me. Oh, hello, Dennis. Where are you going? I'm going down to the doctor's and have my appendix taken out. Where are you going? <laughs> Wait a minute. Did I hear that right? Dennis, you're going to have your appendix out? Why not? I have an insurance policy that entitles me to an operation. <laughs> 
Well, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. No, it isn't. After I read my policy, I thought it would be smarter to have my appendix taken out. Why? It was either that or have a baby. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake. Dennis, what kind of insurance is this you've got anyway? Oh, it's a good policy, Mr. Benny. It's full coverage. Full coverage? Yeah, if a truck runs over me, they fix the truck. <laughs> well, let's not talk about that anymore. Mind if I read your newspaper, kid? No, go ahead. I'm finished with it. Thanks. You know, they lifted the blockade in Anaheim. I know. I... They lifted the blockade in Anaheim? Yeah, they're letting in oranges from Azusa. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. Now, let me read the paper, will you? Hmm. The pot breaks records at Preakness. Hey, Mr. Benny, where are you going with your violin? I want to take my lesson from Professor LeBlanc. Oh, you're not kidding me. You're going downtown and playing some street corner. <laughs> now, Dennis, that's silly. Would you go downtown and sing on some street corner? I don't have to. I got two shows. Oh, <laughs> Hey, celebrity, this is West 6th Street. <laughs> Hold it, this is where I get off. So long, Dennis. Pierre? Pierre? Yes, Suzette? Pierre, I cannot understand you. You sit there with a sprained ankle, and yet there is such a happy look on your face. <laughs> Oh, oui, ma chérie. Because of this ankle, I do not have to give Monsieur Benny a violin lesson. Oh. Pierre, this Monsieur Benny, he is a moving picture star, no? Oui, he is a moving picture star, no. <laughs> Who can that be? Maybe it is the landlord. No, no, he would not come to a dump like this. <laughs> I will see. Oh, how do you do? Uh, does Professor LeBlanc live here? Oui. I am Mrs. LeBlanc. Well, I'm Jack Benny. Sacre bleu. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> Suzette, who is he? Oh, it's me, Professor. I heard what happened to you, so I came over here for my lesson. Sacre bleu. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Professor, how's your sprained ankle? A dismal failure. <laughs> what? Nothing, nothing. If you are here for a lesson, let's get it over with. We? Oui. I mean, yes. <laughs> now, Professor, when you were giving me my last lesson, what were we doing? You were playing the blue Danube, and I was picking up the dead flies. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, after that. Anyway, what number, uh, what number do you want me to play today? The same one you have been practicing for weeks and weeks and weeks. Minuet l'antique. Oh, yes, yes. Here, I'll get my violin out of the cage. Suzette, aren't you going to kiss me goodbye? I am not going out. You will in a minute. <laughs> well, here we are. Now, just a second. I, I better tune up. Does not make any difference. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, I, I have to be in tune. Now, uh, shall I start with the minuet, Lanty? Start, start, start with anything. <laughs> okay. No, 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 Mr. Benny. Every week you make the same mistake. How many times do I have to tell you it is not? Da, 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 da. Oh. You have to slide. Da, da, da. Oh, yes, yes. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get it this time. Sacre bleu. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Ha, <laughs> 
Why? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, Pierre. What is it, Suzette? Vous la prenez à jouer au violon depuis deux ans. Je ne l'ai tant doute qu'une fois, mais il est le plus mauvais joueur que j'ai tant doute dans toute ma vie. Oui. Oh, Professor, what did she say? It loses something in the translation, but it means you stink. <laughs> it sounds lovely in French. <laughs> Shall I, shall I take it again? We, 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 we. Okay. Sacre bleu. Professor. Professor, why did you make me stop? The baby's hair turned gray. Well, I'll take my lesson some other time. Goodbye. Good night, doll. Good night, everybody. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, and yours truly, Don Wilson. You may know, this is National Pickle Week. We'd like to honor the occasion, but since we can't bring you a pickle, we bring you a man who's a barrel of fun, Jack Benny! Thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, you certainly went a long way for that introduction, didn't you? Oh, no, I didn't, Jack. This really is National Pickle Week. Well, dilly dilly. <laughs> Jack, a pickle's nothing to laugh at. Our first joke proved your point. <laughs> but as long as it is National Pickle Week, I want to say congratulations to all the Mama Pickles, Papa Pickles, and all the little boys and gherkins. <laughs> Now, Don, let's get on with the... Hello, Jack. Oh, hello, Mary. I'm glad you got over your cold. We missed you last week. Well, thanks. Uh, what are you and Don talking about? What are we talking about? You mean you haven't heard? Heard what? All over the country, flags are flying, parades are forming, and you don't know? Know what? Mary, this is National Pickle Week. <laughs> Yeah, that's a cucumber that had its option picked up by Heinz. <laughs> hey, you know, Don's right. I am a barrel of fun. Yeah. For this, I had to get well. <laughs> well, you can thank me, Mary, for sending my doctor over to take care of you. Oh, fine. Some doctor. What are you talking about? He's an excellent physician. Yeah, but boy, is he nearsighted. Huh? As he came into the house, I thought I'd save a little time. So when he walked over to me, I stuck out my tongue and he hung his hat on it. <laughs> hung his hat on your tongue? Then he walked over to the clothes rack and said, Don't stand there in the corner with three coats on. If you're cold, get in bed. <laughs> Gee, I didn't know he was that nearsighted. <laughs> he can't hear either. The doctor can't hear? I said goodbye to him four days ago and he's still there. <laughs> Oh, well, anyway, Mary, you're back on the program. That's all that matters. Because tonight we're going to do a very important sketch. Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes? I drove you down to the studio of my cab, didn't I? Yes, yes, you did. The fare was $1.95, and I paid you. Well, I've been thinking about the tip. The tip? What about it? Look, I know this is National Pickle Week, but I'd rather have money. <laughs> You'll keep what I gave you. Goodbye. <laughs> You've got a lot of nerve breaking in on my program with those silly... Wait a minute, Jackson. Don't get mad at the cab driver. He deserves a lot of credit. The guy comes in here without a script and gets a laugh. So what? Well, that's the way we'll all have to do on television. No scripts, no nothing. We'll have to ad lib our way. Well, I won't have any trouble. I'm a barrel of fun. <laughs> I don't care if you're a barrel of bourbon. Sit down and oh, learn Oh, yes, something. you do. <laughs> Uh, 
Not unless you're 100 proof. <laughs> now, look, I'll show you how television's going to be, Jackson. Hey, Livy, ask me. Ask me what I did yesterday. Okay, Phil. What'd you do yesterday? I played golf. You see, it's easy. <laughs> Well, Phil, what's funny about that? Don't rush me. Now, come on, Liv. Ask me what happened on the first tee. Okay. What happened on the first tee? <laughs> I drove off and hit Walter Pigeon. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, look, Phil, what's funny about hitting Walter Pigeon? Well, don't you get it? On my first shot, I got a birdie. <laughs> Phil, Phil, you're going to do a corny routine like that on television? Well, that's the idea, Jackson. Milton Burrow will steal it, get thrown off a of television, and then there's a chance for us. <laughs> well, I hope he steals our first three pages. It'll give him a running start. <laughs> Jack, I think Milton is very clever. Oh, he is, eh? Libby's right, Jackson. Milton is a burl of fun. <laughs> oh, yes, you like a car without brakes. There ain't no stopping you. <laughs> uh, don't worry, folks. He'll be normal in a couple of days. Yoakum's moon will soon be over. <laughs> Now, look, kids, I started to tell you that we have a very important sketch to do tonight. Oh, hello, Mr. Benny. Oh, hello, Dennis. What's that you're eating? A pickle. A pickle? Yeah, cab driver gave it to me in change. <laughs> oh, well, how how come you took a cab from home? Oh, I didn't come from home. I came from the airport. Well, Dennis, have you been away? Oh, no. A friend of mine is learning to fly, and when he got through with his lesson, I put on a parachute and he took me for a ride. Dennis, your friend is just learning to fly, and you went for a ride with him? Uh-huh. Weren't you afraid? Afraid of what? We were riding in his car. <laughs> Now, wait a minute. Look, kid, if you were riding in a car, why did you wear a parachute? In case you went up on a grease rack. <laughs> well, I asked a question, he gave me an answer. And it wasn't bad for this late in the season. Imagine going up on a grease rack. You know, Dennis, you're silly, but you're cute. Yeah, you dames are all alike. <laughs> what? You go nuts about men who live dangerously. <laughs> Dennis. Kiss me, Liv. Well, of all the... That kid gets sillier every program. By the time we go off the air... Mary! 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 <laughs> Mary, why'd you do that to Dennis? He asked for a kiss, so I gave it to him. <laughs> and it wasn't bad for this late in the season. <laughs> All right. Now, look, Janice, we got a very important sketch to do tonight, so sing your song now. I'm a nervous wreck, but I'll try. Oh. Okay. That was a chapter in my life of Dennis Day called Mary, sung by Dennis Day, and very good, Dennis. And now, ladies and gentlemen, tonight for our feature attraction, we're going to do our own original story based on those two great fight pictures, The Champion and The Setup. In this thrilling story of the squared circle, I'm going to play the part of... Uh-oh. What's the matter, Jack? The script. Mary, would you go to my dressing room and see if Rochester got the script for the play? Okay, I'll be right back. Oh, hello, Miss Livingston. Hello, Rochester. Mr. Benny wants to know if the scripts are ready. Yes, here they are. I was just reading them. <laughs> well, what are you laughing at? It says Mr. Benny's going to play the part of a prize fighter. Well, I don't think it's so far-fetched for Mr. Benny to be a prize fighter. After all, he does have a nice physique. Miss Livingston, you see him with his clothes on. I undress him. <laughs> so what? It's like he's an artichoke. You keep taking things off till you're down to nothing. <laughs> making things up. Are you going to listen to the sketch? Oh, no. While the program is on, I have to call people up and find out who their favorite comedian is. Well, I thought Mr. Hooper did that. We have our own system. Would you like to see how it works? Yes. Okay. I'll, I'll take some numbers from the telephone book. Uh, I'll start with this one. Hello, 
this is the Acme Radio Survey. Is your favorite comedian Jack Benny? Oh. <laughs> This is the Acme Radio Survey. Is your favorite comedian Jack Benny? Oh. Uh, Rochester, I better go. Wait, I'll try again. This is the Acme Radio Survey. Is your favorite comedian Jack Benny? <laughs> Mr. Benny is waiting for these scripts. Okay, here you are, Miss Livingston. Now, let's see. I'll pick another number. Mary, Mary, how about the scripts? I've got them. Well, hurry up now. Everyone's waiting. Don, you hand them out, will you? Oh, all right, Jack. Now, kids, when we do this play, I want everybody to... Tr- I'll get it. Hello? The Acme Radio Survey? <laughs> yes. Yes, he is. Yes, I, I listen to them all the time. And now, kids. <laughs> and now, kids, as I was saying. Boss, boss, I found one of my Good, good. <laughs> now, kids, you've all. Mary, stop looking at me. Now, kids, you've all got your script, so let's get started with the play. And now for our play. Let's go, Don. Ladies and gentlemen, for our feature attraction tonight, we present a thrilling, dramatic story of the prize ring entitled The Champion Setup. Curtain music. <laughs> champion of the world. People say I'm a heel. They say I slug my own grandma. But they're wrong. Grandma's a heavyweight. <laughs> I struggled in the championship with a tough one. It started two years ago. I was trudging along a dusty Kansas road, hitchhiking with my best friend, Bubble. Tired, Bubble? Uh, pretty much, Mitch. Well, we'll be in Los Angeles in a few days. I hear it's a great place. Hey, Bubble, look out. Here comes the car. Hey, do you boys want a lift? The car stopped in front of us. It was the latest model driven by a beautiful girl with a convertible top. <laughs> I could tell by the dark part in her blonde hair. <laughs> hit her golden curls that glistened. The most beautiful hair I'd ever seen. I promised myself that when I got rich, I was going to buy some like <laughs> There was a man sitting next to her. As Bubbles and I started to get into the car, she said, Pop into the back seat, boys. Thanks a lot. Don't mention us. Gee, that's a beautiful car. What kind is it? Cadillac. I thought it was a Buick. Look at all those holes in the side. They got those in an argument with the sheriff in El Paso. Oh. How far are you boys going? All the way to Los Angeles. Los Angeles, eh? I got an aunt who lives in a suburb of Los Angeles. Glendale? No, Tehachapi. <laughs> oh. By the way, miss, your boyfriend doesn't seem very talkative. Talks with his fist. He's Slugger Brown, the middleweight champ of the world. Yeah. <laughs> we can only take you boys as far as Omaha. Slugger's fighting there tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Are you really Slugger Brown? Yeah. You're you're the middleweight champ? Yeah. You're fighting tonight in Omaha? Yeah. 
And this is the title fight? Yeah. Thirty-six years later, we arrived at home. <laughs> During the ride, I found out a lot about Slugger and his girlfriend, Dill. Her name used to be Mary, but she changed it in honor of National Pickle Week. <laughs> I watched the fight that night and saw Slugger Brown collect 30,000 bucks. It was then I, Mitch Benny, decided to become a prize fighter. Bubbles and I hitchhiked to Los Angeles, and I went to see the foremost fight manager in town. I stripped myself to the waist. He looked at my chest and said, That reminds me, I'm having spare ribs for dinner. Don't be funny, Mr. O'Brien. I may not look so good now, but you give me two or three months of training, I'll be a champion someday. Do you hear? A champion. Now, wait a minute, son. Fighting is a tough but game. I used to be a fighter myself, and I'll never forget my last bout, which was Killer Nelson. I tried to slug it out with him for the first three rounds, and then I decided I'd better stay away from him, so I got on my bicycle. But he finally got me. What happened? My trunks got caught in the chain. <laughs> oh. And you didn't swim the fight. <laughs> Send three. <laughs> now, look, Mr. O'Brien, I want to be a fighter. Will you handle me? All right, kid. I'll be your manager. Go over to the gym and let my trainer, Punch McNeil, get you in condition. Bubbles and I went over to the gym. The large, gloomy place, smelling a liniment. Here in this edifice of concrete and steel, men dedicated their lives to the inhuman pursuit of mangling and maiming. It was here that the beast and man overrode all human qualities. And one man would try to batter another's confidence beyond recognition for the sake of monetary reward. <laughs> Gee, that new writer I got from Lux is terrific. <laughs> Excuse me, mister, but I'm looking for Punchy McNeil. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> well, I'm Midge Benny. Uh, I'm pleased to know you. <laughs> now, look, Punchy, I'm trying to be a fighter. Mr. O'Brien wants you to handle me. Okay, but you ought to think it over. Fighting is a tough racket. Yeah, I should know because I used to be a fighter myself. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, I had my first fight back in 1932. God. Yeah, I spent 12 years in the ring. 12 years? Yeah, but I finally came to, got up, and went home. <laughs> well, look, Punchy, I want to... Hey, wait a minute. I, I didn't finish my story. Oh, there's more? Yeah. What? <laughs> oh, well, tell me, Punchy... Were you always a fighter? Oh, no. I used to be a musician with Guy Lombardo's band. Go on. You were never with Lombardo. Oh, yes. Yes. Yes, I was. You're a little flat on that last... Hey, come on, Mitch. Let's start training. Two weeks later, I won my first fight. A week later, my second, and my third, fourth, fifth, until I had won 28 fights. In two short years, I was matched to fight the champ, Slugger Brown. I was in my dressing room with my manager when the door opened. Hello, Midge. How you doing? It was her again. She was wearing a dress that must have been made by the Hudson Automobile Company. The neckline was so low, she had to step down to get into it. <laughs> Hello, baby. How's about a date tonight after I knock out the champ? I got news for you, Miz. You're not knocking out anybody. You're throwing the fight. Are you kidding? You don't believe me? Here's your manager. Ask him. O'Brien, are you crazy? Would I fight for two years in tank towns for this? Would I spend two years getting my brains knocked out just so I could take a dive? Would I work my way up to the title bow just to throw the fight? Would I? Would I? Why don't you turn the page and find out? <laughs> Dive in the fifth round. My new writer from 
Lux to double cross me. <laughs> I wasn't going to do it. I'd worked with Paul to be champion. And tonight, I was going to fight to win. He's dressed up saying at 159 pounds, wearing purple trunks, the middleweight champion of the world, Slugger Abram. <laughs> And his worthy opponent, weighing 155 pounds, wearing bifocal glasses, is the bag! Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the radio audience. The men are in the center of the ring receiving their instructions. They go back to their corners waiting for the bell. And there it is, round one. Slugger comes out of his corner and starts mixing furiously. Midge meets him like a wildcat with a right and a left. And now for a few words from our sponsor. Look sharp, feel sharp, be sharp. Use a wherever grindstone and sharpen your silly face off. <laughs> now back to the fight. Well, that was an exciting round. <laughs> Still bleeding and Midge's eye is tightly closed. Now we're waiting for the bell for the second round. There's the bell. The boys come out and circle each other. They're still circling each other. We circled each other three times. And my opponent leaned over to me and said, Hey, Bunt. Bunt. <laughs> Who, me? Yeah. Come here a minute. What is it? What round are you going to take a dive then? The fifth. Uh-uh. <laughs> what? Make it the third. The third? Why? My feet are killing me. <laughs> well, it's Slugger. I'm not throwing this fight. I'm in here to win, so start mixing it. Well, okay, it's your nose. Ooh! The champ lands a terrific right cross, and Midge Benny is down. Yes, I was down. The referee is counting over him. Yes, the referee was counting over him. The count is up to five. Yes, the count is up to five. Now Midge is rolling over on his back. Yes, I was rolling over on my back. Why don't you shut up? <laughs> yes, why don't I shut up? If I lay there beaten and dazed, my whole career flashed in front of me. I was started two years ago when I was trudging along a dusty canvas hitchhiking with my best friend, Bubbles. You tired, Bubbles? Pretty much, Midge. Hey, Bubbles, look out. Here comes the car. Hey, you boys want a lift? Oh, no. We're not going through that again. <laughs> Come on, Bubbles. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be with you again next Sunday night at the same time when we... I'll get it. Hello? Mr. Benny? Speaking. I am the president of the Pasadena Pickle Factory, and I want to thank you for saving me 200 gallons of vinegar. I saved you 200 gallons of vinegar? Yeah. While your program was on, he had our cucumbers next to the radio, and they all turned sour. <laughs> Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is our final broadcast of the season, and as you know, farewells are always sad, and doing the final program is always sad. So, without further ado, we bring you radio's saddest comedian, Jack Benny. Thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, that was a rather puzzling introduction. Puzzling? Yes, only last Sunday, in honor of National Pickle Week, you said I was a barrel of fun. <laughs> now, now, how in one short week could I deteriorate from a barrel of fun to radio status comedian? How could that be? Well, it's really very simple, Jack. A pickle is something sour. Now, according to Webster's Dictionary, sour means morose. Morose means gloomy. Gloomy means sad. So it's very logical for you to go from National Pickle Week to radio status comedian. See? <laughs> Well, Don, I've looked in Webster's Dictionary myself. 
And I found out that when you pickle a thing, it's submerged in brine. When it's submerged in brine, it's preserved. When it's preserved, it's canned. And that's exactly what you are. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, having said farewell to beautiful Don Wilson, you can continue... Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Jack. You wouldn't fire me on the last show of the season. You're not that cheap. You want to bet, Don? <laughs> Speaking of things pickled, here's Phil Harris. <laughs> you can stop with that too, Jack. I ain't had a drink in two weeks since Remley had his accident. Remley had an accident? What happened to him? Oh, it was horrible, Jackson. Ghastly. <laughs> he was carrying a bowl full of goldfish when somebody yelled, Bottoms up. <laughs> you you mean Yep, drained it, sand and all. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that about Frankie. Uh, it must have been awful. Well, he didn't mind the fish of the sand, but that water nearly killed him. <laughs> Look, Phil, why don't you... Oh, Jack, Jack, I hate to interrupt, but uh, I'm really worried about your firing me. Oh, for goodness sake, Don, I was only kidding. I wouldn't fire you. You've been with me for 15 years. Cut your salary, maybe, but not fire. <laughs> so forget it. Oh, well, I guess I was silly to let it bother me. After all, you couldn't be that cheap. Want a bet? Oh. oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Mary. Hello, Don. How you live? <laughs> hello, Curly, you Ollie Con of Encino. <laughs> oh, cut it out, Libby. You're embarrassing me. Oh, fine. Look who's trying to act modest. Uh, yeah, on the bump of his car is a rubber stamp that says, You lucky pedestrian, you've just been hit by Phil Harris. <laughs> That's right. Oh, Mary, you're kidding. No, I'm not. Jack, take off your shirt and show him. <laughs> Mary, Phil hit me while I was bending over, and let's forget it. <laughs> By the way, Don, since this is our final show of the season, where are you going on your vacation? Well, I'm going to spend two glorious weeks at the Brown Derby. <laughs> That's nice. What are you going to do, Mary? Well, my sister Babe is coming to visit me, and we're going hunting. Hunting? Isn't that more of a sport for a man? That's what Babe's hunting for. <laughs> Well, it's a shame nature gave her such bad ammunition. <laughs> I'm still a barrel of fun. <laughs> what, uh, what about your vacation, Phil? Can't take any, Jackson. I'm making a picture for 20th Century Fox. A picture? What's the name of it? Take me out to the brewery. <laughs> good, good. That's a nice title there. Say, Jack, yeah? uh, before we went on the air, you said you were going to do something special on the program today. What is it? Well, Mary, I thought it'd be nice on this last show to introduce all the people connected with the program. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce another talented actor named Joe Kern. You know him as Ed, the man who guards my underground vault. He's been there for years, and whenever I go down to get money, he always says, Oh, who goes there? Friend or foe? Friend. What's the password? A penny saved is a... Oh, it's you, Mr. Ben. <laughs> yes, Ed. I'd like to get some money out of the vault for my summer vacation. I'm going to drive to New York. Where? New York. Where? New Amsterdam. Oh. <laughs> well, let's take care of everything while I'm gone. I'll see you again. Goodbye, Ed. Goodbye, Mr. Benny. <laughs> and now, folks, another actor whose appearance on this program, whose appearances, rather, on this program, are always greeted with laughter. Because he's one... Oh, but... Bud. Who, me? Yeah. Come here a minute. Uh, what do you want? What actor are you going to introduce now? Uh, uh Frank Nelson. Uh-uh. <laughs> what? Introduce... Sheldon Leonard. Well, why should I introduce Sheldon Leonard now? Because that's me, and I just laid six to five, I'd come in ahead of Nelson. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, the man who plays the part of our tout, Sheldon Leonard. Now, Mr. Leonard, will it be all right if I introduce Frank Nelson? Well, okay, it's your show. Good, good. 
At this moment, folks, I'd like to present Frank Nelson. Let's see, where is he? Uh, oh, Mr. Mr. <laughs> Are you Frank Nelson, the actor? Now, what do you think I'm doing with this script in my hand? Swatting flies? <laughs> all right, all, I just want people to meet you. But you know, Frank, it's funny. Whenever I run into you on the program, you're always so antagonistic toward me. Yes. Well, look, Frank. <laughs> well, look, Frank. Of course, that. <laughs> I can't wait for this next one. Well, look, Frank. That's just on the program. But in real life, do you really hate me? Oh, do I? <laughs> You Frank Nelson. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a radio program is only as funny as the writers make it. And I happen to be fortunate enough to have four of the greatest, most talented, most original, most versatile writers in the entire industry. Mary, introduce my writers. Why don't you introduce them? Every time I look at them, I get sick. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll do it. My writers are Sam Perrin, Milt Josephsberg, George Balzer, and John Packerberry. <laughs> uh, Sam, I understand you're going to spend your vacation at the Flamingo Hotel in Las Vegas. Yes, and thanks for mentioning it. Now I won't have to pay. And, George, you're going to spend your vacation at the Del Mar Hotel in Del Mar. Thanks for mentioning it, Jack. Now I won't have to pay. And, Tack, you're going to spend your vacation at the Shamrock Hotel in Houston. Thanks for mentioning it, Jack. Now I won't have to pay. And, Milt, you're going to spend your vacation at your brother's house in Brooklyn. Thanks for mentioning it, Jack, but he's still going to charge me. <laughs> hey, Milt, he has to. I own the house. I'm <laughs> too. And what... And working in close cooperation with me and the writers is our little script girl, Jeanette Iman. Hello, Blue Eyes. I'm going to miss you this summer. <laughs> she can't type, but she's a good secretary. <laughs> you know, folks, all the people I introduced here tonight will be with us again next season, as well as my regular cast. Me too, Mr. Benny? Yes, you too, Dennis. And don't do anything silly right now, because I was just going to talk about you. You were? Yeah. I was going to say, Dennis, that you're talented, clever, versatile, and you're looked up to as one of the most promising personalities in radio. And you know what that means coming from me. Yeah, when you're all washed up, you want me to give you a job. <laughs> hmm. Dennis, Jack really meant what he said, and I feel the same way. You're not only a fine entertainer, but you're modest, considerate, kind, and one of the nicest boys I've ever met. Oh, I can understand it coming from you. Why? You're nuts about me. <laughs> all right, all right. Look, Dennis, what, it's time for your song. What's it going to be? Well, I'm going to sing Three Wishes, which is my latest recording. Good. On sale at all music stores. Go ahead, Dennis. 75 cents. Dennis, sing! <laughs> okay. That was Dennis Day singing his latest recording, Three Wishes. On the other side is a kiss in the dark. I know, I know. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, there are two telephone operators on my program whom you've enjoyed many times. B. Benadera, who plays the part of Gertrude, and Sarah Byrne, who plays the part of Mabel. Well, Jack, I don't see the girls around. You don't? Well, then maybe they're still at the switchboard. I'll pick up the phone and find out. Oh, Mabel, what is it, guy says? <laughs> Mr. Benny's line is flashing. Yeah, I wonder what Judy Splinters wants now. <laughs> Shall I answer it and find out? Eh, let him wait. I had a date with him last week to go to the movies, and he kept me waiting for two hours. I'd have gotten awfully tired if I wasn't sitting down. Sitting down? Yeah. When Mr. Benny takes you to the movies, he meets you inside. <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> He's a slick one. <laughs> Once he took me up on Mulholland Drive, shut off the motor, and then he said, You know, honey, my back itches. Would you mind rubbing it for me? So, then he said, I want to take my shirt off. Would you mind closing your eyes? All right, so you closed your eyes and rubbed his back. Rubbed his back nothing. 
When I got through, I found out I simonized his car. <laughs> oh. Well, a rules and Operator, men. operator. Gertrude. Mabel. Well, folks, I really did want you to meet them, but I guess the switchboard is busy. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to introduce one of the most versatile actors in radio, Mel Blanc. As you may or may not know, Mel plays several parts on my program. For instance, <clears throat> when I come downstairs in the morning and walk into my den, Mel looks at me and says, <coughs> Oh, hello, Polly. Hello. <coughs> and many times, the Polly had to listen to me take my violin lessons. But Polly never complained because she knew my French violin teacher was also Mel Blank. No, 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 Mr. Benny. How many times must I tell you it is not... <coughs> Oh, uh, what's the use? Mr. Benny, my money, please. <laughs> then every once in a while on my travels, I have to take a train. And at the railroad station, again, you hear Mel Blank. Train leaving on track five for Anaheim, Azusa, and Coop. Then sometimes I decide... Babunga. <laughs> then sometimes I decide not to take the train and go by automobile. And when I get in my car and step on the starter, does the motor start? No. Again, it's Mel Blank. <laughs> Thank you, Mel Blank, and good luck with that wonderful novelty song you wrote, Big Bear Lake. And that's a wonderful recording you made of it with the Sportsman Quartet. Well, folks, the program is almost over. And it looks as though we've brought on everybody except... There he is now. Hello? Hello, Mr. Perry. This is Rochester. <laughs> oh, hello, Rochester. You got my car ready for my trip? Almost, boss. I'm looking for a piece of cheesecloth so I can strain the oil into the crankcase. But, Rochester, the last time you poured the oil right out of the can. You didn't bother to strain it. I know, and when you drove away, the exhaust pipe kept spitting sardines. <laughs> oh, yes, I remember. Well, anyway, it'll be a long automobile trip to New York, so be sure and put my Charlie's Ant costume in the back seat. Your Charlie's Ant costume? Yes, the skirt, the blouse, and my sheerest nylon. Oh, boss, why go through all that? If you get a flat, fix it yourself. <laughs> I know what I'm doing. Anyway, I'll be home right after the broadcast. We'll have everything ready. Okay. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, say, boss. What is it? I happened to glance at the road map, and I noticed that you're driving east the same way you always do. That's right. I'm going straight to the Mississippi River. Then I turn north, go up to Canada, through Toronto, across to Quebec, and then down the east coast. You don't have to do that this year, boss. When you get to the Mississippi River, you can go right across now. I can? Yeah, and I took the toll off that bridge. <laughs> Good, good. Well, so long, Rochester. Goodbye. Well, I guess that just about winds up. Oh, Jack. Up a... Jack. Yes, Don? While you were talking to Rochester, a gentleman dropped in to see you. He's from Washington. Oh, from Washington? Yes, my name is Vernon Clark, and I'm from the United States Treasury Department. The, uh... Treasury Department? Jack, get up off your knees. He's here to give you something. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry. I mean, I mean, I'm happy. I mean, what is it, Mr. Clark? Huh? Well, Jack, I'm here to thank you on behalf of the Treasury Department for the motion picture short you made to spur on the opportunity drive. Well, thank you very much. And I think the title of this picture, The Spirit of 49, is very appropriate. And when it is released in all the theaters in the country, I'm sure it'll be very successful and stimulating the sale of savings bonds. Well, I hope so, too. And by the way, Mr. Clark, I can appreciate the responsibility you have in the Treasury Department because uh, I happen to be the treasurer of the Beverly Hills Beavers Club. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine, Jack, because I'm going to present you with something that you can keep in your Beavers Clubhouse. And what's that, Mr. Clark? Well, it's a citation and a uh, Sidney Williams replica of the covered leg in which it's symbolic 
of the spirit of 49 and is a symbol of this year's Opportunity Drive. Thank you very much, Mr. Clark. It's a great honor to receive <laughs> On today's broadcast, you met nearly everyone associated with my program. But before we leave the air, I'd like, like to also thank my two sound men, Jim Murphy and Gene Twombly, my engineer, George Foster, my CBS contact man, Lucian Davis, the Bert Scott, oh, Jack, and Jack, Hillard. Uh, you better speed it up. We're running late. Oh, yes, that's my producer. I was just going to do some Hillard, Hillard Mark. Thank you for mentioning it, Jack, but you'll still have to pay me. I know, I know. And now my entire cast joins me in wishing each and every one of you a very pleasant summer. Good night. <laughs>